hey, you guys know me. Every other word out of my mouth must be civil war <laughs> or something like that. And people are in the chat saying, Tim, civil war pool. Well, I certainly think we're in a cold civil war. Maybe it's even hot. It's just too early for us to realize it on a grand scale. But things are absolutely getting crazy. We have a couple big stories. I mean, one of which is this Black Lives Matter activist who was arrested. Oh, you need to turn that volume down. What are you doing here? I got you, homie. I get, I get one. <laughs> you get one. This Black Lives Matter activist was uh, bailed out by BLM, by Black Lives Matter in Louisville, Louisville, after he was uh, arrested over the attempted assassination of a Jewish Democrat. Now, they're saying he's mentally unwell. Other people have pointed out, it's been reported, that he was actually advocating for a black nationalist organization called, um, oh, what was the name of it? I'm forgetting the name. Is the is the uh, armed forces of some uh, extremist organization or whatever? Pan African socialists or something? No, it was like oh. it was it was a similar group to the Black Hebrew Israelites. Hmm. And so when this stuff happens and you're getting the you know attempted assassination of politicians, it's coming right after Adam Kinzinger said, you know, he believes that it's possible a civil war is gonna, could start, and if it does, you will see targeted assassinations. So I want to get into this, and we do have a lot of stories coming out now. We got the National Guard deployed in New Mexico to be teachers and hmm. things like that. We've got the trucker convoy, obviously. That's up, up, that's up in Canada, but there's talk of an American convoy. We've got cancel culture. We've got, uh, you know, similar issues around this. We've got to, in Florida, they've just uh, passed a bill to ban abortion after 15 weeks, which, of course, is generating a lot of controversy. Joining us to discuss this in depth is the author of The Next Civil War, Stephen Marsh. Hey, pleasure to be here. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? I'm a writer. I'm a Canadian. Uh, I wrote this wonderful book. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I sort of think a next civil war is very much a real possibility for the United States in the near future. I think you wrote, um, what did you write for The Guardian? The next civil war is Well, that was here. an excerpt from the book. I mean, the book got excerpted in The Guardian and The Washington Post and Foreign Policy. Mm. Uh, sort of the more technical aspects got, uh, got excerpted in Foreign Policy. And so, yeah, like it's, it's been around like this, this is, and it was based on an article I wrote in 2018 in Canada uh, about the possibility of a civil war, um, which I was talking about then in 2018. And so, yeah, I'm a, you know, I'm a stray cat journalist. I go around and write for whoever leaves that a little plate of milk for me. Nice. So we, we, I think we've actually on this show discussed your article. I know I talked about it on one of my, uh, my other channels. Oh yeah. And I think there's like a core that we completely agree on. But then there's like a divergent worldview we have based on, you know, the different political parties, which I think will be a really interesting conversation. So what's the core we agree on? Well, the uh, I think it's, you know, people are forming at the time we read the article. It was easy for me to pull out the excerpt. And be <laughs> right. Like, you mentioned something about people are sort of tribalizing. They're focusing more on, you know, their own in groups and things like that. And that's causing this like outward spread. You've, you've talked about things like cancel culture. You've, yeah. Specific scenarios and stuff. So I'm like, I'm reading your articles and I'm like, I think we we agree on those things. But then there's certain specific points in politics I think we'll have dis disagreements on. Sure, yeah. But, but that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, whether or not we agree on something like a trucker convoy, it doesn't change the fact that the core of what's happening, civil war, conflict, the escalation, we agree. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think... An, a, a nonpartisan observer can look at the United States. I mean, it's a textbook case of a country headed for civil war. It's mm -hmm. not really a question of your political affiliation. It's really a question of deep structures that, uh, that you know anyone can see. So it's those are not. I, I don't really think of that as a partisan issue. Really. Right, I agree. And, like, and and what I keep saying is, you know, to a lot of, a lot of people who maybe are you know on one side or the other. It doesn't matter if you think you're right. What matters is both sides think they're right. Well, I mean, there's that old expression, would you rather be married or right? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. And like in America, a lot of people would rather be right than married. You know, that, that's that's where you're at now. I mean, I should say, like, I don't really think of myself as a partisan in the United States because I'm a Canadian. So my like when we I can talk about Canada, we can definitely talk about Canada. But, you, you know, what we're seeing in Canada is essentially a proxy conflict for the hyper partisanship in the United States. And. You know, I think of myself like I, I think when you think of Canada, you think left. But honestly, as I've crossed the United States writing this book and as I've interviewed the experts, I'm not part of these tribes. Mm. Yeah. Right. Like I'm outside of all of these tribes. So it's it's not really that we have a difference in tribalism so much as I have a different perspective because I'm a different cit citizen of a different country. Well, so we'll, we'll get into everything. Yeah, we'll get into all this stuff. Plus, we have a bunch of other stories too, we can get into the specifics on. But also hanging out is Daniel Turner.
Yes, great to be back. Daniel Turner, your favorite energy expert, powerthefuture.com. Yes. And because of the coming civil war, I live on a very large farm, <laughs> far, far away from civilization. So I'm fascinated for this conversation. So good to be we here. Have, we, have, we have incredible chicken conversations <laughs> behind the scenes. This seems like a pretty functioning farm to me. I mean, you got fresh eggs. I see the uh, incubator downstairs. I mean, yeah. like you're one step away from Jeremy Clarkson running a like I, I own a farm show. I mean, yes. well, I, we, we, we grew some vegetables in our garden, but, you know, we actually had a How'd they go? Uh, we grew all tomatoes at once because we were newbies and didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. And then we had like 50 tomatoes <laughs> to eat at one time. Oh, that's when you need to can them. You need to get yeah. the you need to get the sauces going. We we went berry picking because there's, um, what are they called? Wine berries everywhere. This is a beautiful part of the United States of America, yeah. I got to say. This little corner of West Virginia, mm -hmm. Maryland. In, I mean, In the summertime, there's wine berries. They're a Chinese raspberry and they're everywhere. And people pull over their cars on the side of the road and pluck some and just eat them. But we'll get into all yeah, that yeah, as well. Sure, they're good. Am I here to talk about agriculture? Yeah, I didn't yes. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, you rate wine berries on a scale from one to ten? <laughs> yeah, right. Good to see you, man. The pleasure good. to be here. Look forward to hearing about this uh, so this documentation you've come across. Uh, I'm not going to waste any time, Ian Crossland. Catch you guys soon. I am stoked for this conversation with our northern neighbor. Canadians are always incredibly nice guests and very nice people in general. And it's been a really interesting conversation for the show. It's going to be a great one. So glad you're here. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com and become a member to help support all of our work, support our journalists, support this show. As a member, you'll get access to exclusive members-only segments from the TimCast IRL podcast. Now, truth be told, because of how we're going to be handling today's episode, it'll be a little different. Normally, we focus on like topical news. I don't think we're going to have a members segment because I think we're going to try and hit every possible point we can in one big conversation. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally we try and like create like a special segment for, for members. So I think we might, we just might go a little bit longer than usual, but let it be open and uh, free to the public for everybody to just watch. But that being said, we do have a massive library of members only videos. You definitely want to check those out because you're helping make sure this business can continue to operate. If uh, in the face of cancel culture and all that stuff, this is how this is how it all operates, and uh, you keep our journalists employed. So don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Let's just jump in to the first article we have here from January 4th by a man named Stephen Marsh. Oh. The next U.S. Civil War is already here. We just refuse to see it. Mm. I saw this. It's, uh, it's tagged by The Guardian, the far right. Oh. And uh, as I was reading it, you know, there are some things in it <clears throat> that I was like, okay, I don't know if I agree with that. I think you talk about uh, voter suppression and things like that. I right. think that's one yeah. of the issues. But I was, but I was, as I was getting into it and talking about how we've got these, uh, you know, look, a, a potential political assassination attempt. That that's not not, uh, not necessarily like a left right thing with this Black Lives Matter activist. It it just shows that there's extremism emerging in this country. But of course, you also have serious things over the past several years, like Charlottesville, where there's just clashes in the street. Yes. So let's just start from the beginning, though. Um, you wrote a book, The Next Civil War. Th this article is titled The Next U.S. Civil War is Already Here. I don't write the headlines. You didn't write that? Yeah. So do you think that it is likely? Is it is it your opinion or is it a, a, a journalist's assessment? Well, the book is really based on the best available models like that's what that's that's how I I did it I tried to keep myself out of it as much as possible um, so you know the leading experts um, that I, foreign policy did a survey like their their number was a 67 percent chance of a civil war um, that that also coincides with polls about average Americans think how likely they think a civil war is so you know I feel with this stuff you don't need to exaggerate it's so scary mm anyway that like I, what I wanted to do in the book is be as precise as possible right and use the best available evidence um, that I could so you know yeah there's there's a process underway in the, the, the United States is a textbook case of a country headed for civil war on a number of fronts and it's not one thing it's actually what they call a complex cascading system so it's things feeding into each other so on one hand it's political illegitimacy on the other hand it's effects of climate change. On the other hand, it's the levels of inequality, which are, which are at unprecedented levels, um, you know, literally levels have, that haven't been seen since 1776. And all of these things contribute to each other and, and, and factor into each other. And that's why the United States is kind of in a unique position, because 
you know, all these things are happening in the rest of the world as well, but it's the way that they feed into each other that creates such a dangerous situation are there any for the United States. Are there specific things that you found factored across multiple potentials that you just kept showing up? Like, this is one of these things that it seems to be in all these scenarios. Well, the big, I mean, the, there are a few ones that are big. Like, I don't, I don't really separate them out because I do think they feed into each other. But like, the decline of faith of institutions. So the, mm. the fact that only 20% of Americans believe their electoral system is fair. Um, you know, that's that's right. That's that's a condition that's just right for civil war. Um, the fact that 33 percent of Americans think that it's OK to use violence if your side loses. And that's equal Democrat Republican. Like it's I think, well, they're very similar. One's 32 percent, one's 36 percent. Right. So that is a huge factor. Um, so th that's a big one. Uh, how, I'm curious how much of that is honest. And what I mean by that well, is... Well, you know, I, these models are all of different strengths. Yeah. So, like, all I can do is tell you what this no, they No, no, for say. sure, for yeah. sure. So I think, um, you know, just leaping off from there, we yeah. have the story about uh, the Black Lives Matter activist right. accused, uh, allegedly shooting this, um, this, this Democrat. Certainly there have been instances where far right and right-wing groups have yes. engaged in violence. But if you look at um, institutional support, when it comes to, say, Black Lives Matter in 2020 you get Kamala Harris soliciting donations to bail out rioters. You have a Black Lives Matter activist who's arrested for the attempted assassination of a politician and Black Lives Matter fronts $100,000 to bail him out. You don't, right. you don't have the same kind of thing on the right. Well, um, let me answer that question in two ways. Okay, so the first thing is that the process that um, civil war experts talk about, and this happens all over the world, it happens in Chile, it happened in other places that had civil war, is called complementary radicalization. So what you have is left-wing groups or right-wing groups taking extremist positions, and this causes people on the other side to get more radical. So that's, that's, a, that's an area that transcends you know, uh, partisanship. Like that's, that's another, that's a process that's underway Yeah. where Definitely. as things get more extreme on the left, they get more extreme on the right. That causes mm -hmm. the left to get more extreme that then causes the right to get more extreme. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's, that's a very toxic uh, process that is extremely hard to escape from. Now, the other thing I would say is that when I talk to you know, this is just, let me just give you this perspective. You can take it or leave it. You know, it might be useful to you. It might not be. But when I talk to like members of secret services of other countries and they're thinking about what a collapsing America looks like, they're not really afraid of the left because the left is inherently self-defeating. Uh, it, it is much less organized than the right. Like, it, and, it, and it's also, it's much less effective as a, as a group. So like when you look at a group like the Oath Keepers, they're in nor they, they they are they have it together like they they have it they are it have it together in a way whereas when you look at left-wing institutions like the women's march after the trump inauguration it had you know somewhere between half a million and a million people at its opening rally it explode it imploded on, in internecine politics almost instantly mm -hmm. and like the term woke institution basically doesn't exist because they eat themselves, right? I, like, so all, all I would say is like, both, both these processes are underway, mm -hmm. but I would say that when, when I talked to experts on civil war from other countries and people who are worried about the stability of the United States, it was definitely far-right extremists that were their primary worry. What about the institutionalization? Well, well hold on, uh, I, I wanted to address this real quick. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, I don't think you're wrong, but uh, the way I say it, uh, the way I see it is, the right I would describe as sharp, the left I would describe as blunt. Mm. Black Lives Matter was able to raise, you know, what, tens of millions of dollars for relatively nebulous causes, but that attracted thousands of people to riot in the streets over yeah. uh, mm. 2020. The damage caused was severe, and it did result in a lot of death, but it was very, very widespread. So typically what we see a lot of, especially um, at the start of, you know, Donald Trump's run for pre the presidency, I was actually on the ground at a lot of these, these Trump rallies, you see a blunt level terrorism. It never exceeded the, the uh, it, it was political violence. I, I, terrorism to me is a technical term that would not apply to that. I well, mean, so in, the they, terms, in terms of this book, like, like it, terrorism is very specific, act, like, like it has very specific consequences and has very specific, I'm not to say that we're not well, dealing with political violence. Well, just I'm just political saying, violence. yeah, polit so, political violence to me is a better term. So uh, the political violence you'd see on the left would be rampant, but low scale. So there'd be yeah. a lot of instances of someone getting punched in the face or someone getting pushed in the street. 
or people running around and knocking over garbage cans. It was incessant. It was never rising to the point where, you know, uh, for a lot of it, people were losing their lives until I think the riots that, but we, we've seen riots but, in the but past. But see, to me, mm -hmm. like as an outsider, like what, who's right and who's wrong and, and the nature of the violence is less important to me than the stability of the system. Right. Like as a Canadian mm. uh, up north, like wanting America to hold on so that we can trade with you. Like what I'm concerned with is the stability of the system. So, you know, like when defund the police happened. Right. Maybe the worst political idea of. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a it's a high bar. Now mm. I'm on but, board with it. But, but no, it's a, yeah, it, keep it going. We love it, it for it, electoral it, purposes. <laughs> keep supporting. Right. Like it, but, you know, also completely non doable yeah. and uh, in well, support. They did, yeah. Well, they yeah. did in one place. They no, couldn't get no, it achieved no. anywhere else. They got it, was, it in Minnesota uh, and then where 200, else? I think 260 departments had their budget slashed. And then they came back right Not away. all of them. I mean. But, but a lot of them did come back. Yeah. Or Chaz, right? Capitol Hill, Autonomous Zone, which is probably the, the number one example yeah, of left wing, of, of left wing resistance to federal authority. I mean, that is a subject in the book. But it, it's really very little. It has very little impact when compared to the militias. So he, well, well, he, what is the, what are the militias like? So I, I can name a ton of things like mm -hmm. Chaz, the Chaz chop. There was, there was the, that was in Seattle. Then you also had the Portland attempts. You had the occupation in, in Minneapolis. That well, the Oath Keeper list, I mean, they have, well, obviously January 6th, I mean, would be at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as a very highly destabilizing action. But, you know, like the other thing about the right is that they're, they understand the importance of institutions in a way that the left does not. This is you understand. I'm I'm not judging. No, no, I'm just saying. Sure. I'm just saying. No, this I, is, I agree. Like like they like when you look at the Oath Keeper list, like when it came out with that forty thousand names, like they'd infiltrated very deeply into police departments, into uh, you know school boards. Uh, like when I talked to Michael German, who's like a who was an undercover agent for with the FBI and far right movements, he was like, once they discovered I had no tattoos, they were like, you're never going to talk to anyone rough ever again we're going to run you on a school board. Like that's, that's what we're going to do. What so I, what, what I'm, what I mean to say, yeah. and just cause I want to make sure I can let Daniel come in is, no, it's um, all good. I think the, the, uh, one of the reasons there's a lot of people who, who don't think that the far right elements, uh, many people on the right don't think that there's a big threat from them because they don't see it a lot. Right. The, the way to describe it is it's sharp versus the left's blunt. You know, the, the, the I think you're, uh, you're right when you say that they know the importance of institutions. The right talks about losing institutional control all the time. What the left doesn't understand, uh, what they have is numbers. People will go out in the street and march and smash things. But a day later, where are those, where are those actors? Yes, and they have no policy. Like, right. they have, they, like, they have, like their policy ideas are unfeasible. Well, that's generally true. I mean, I think, I think like, that's <laughs> that true of the left true. and the right. Yeah. Well, what, what's happening in America is it's entering a post-policy phase. Mm. The government can, I mean, this is the other thing we talked about. You asked, like, what are the major causes? Like, one is this decline in institutions, but it's also that the, you know, the, the government is, America is essentially becoming ungovernable, mm. right? Like, like, it, it no, like, Biden has spent 11 months getting diplomats in place, Right. It, it's con the U.S. government is constantly threatening to renege on its debt. I mean, that is that's playing Russian roulette with all of this, oh, yeah. all of this prosperity. The Federal Reserve is ungoverned. They're, they've never audited there, it. There 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 is a, a huge number of ungovernable. Well, you know, to me, like as a Canadian, when you look at the big Build Back Better bill or whatever it's called, um, that's a budget. That's a Wednesday in a mature democracy. Mm. Like the, the, you just pass a budget and that's it. In the United States, those are th those basic functions of government are increasingly impossible or extremely difficult, and that leads naturally to a politics of rage, right? Where it's like because you can't ever enact policy, whether you're left or right, you become so inf you, you, it, everything becomes aesthetic. Everything becomes a everything becomes an aesthetic, artistic gesture of your own anger and your own beliefs in a in a concept. That is that transcends essentially, you know, real actions, real government actions, mm -hmm. and that's that's a huge to me. That's the, maybe the number one factor. Yeah, well, people uh, think uh, they're uh, supposed uh, to be creating policy. They should be stripping away bad policy right now. When so, you hear when I hear American politicians like think tanks and so on say like we have to do this with the tax rate, we have to, yeah. No, ahead. no, I'm saying no, I'm saying pull, pull up your mic. <clears throat> oh, yeah, oh sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> Like when I hear them talking about policy, like parental leave or something, it's like, you guys can't pass, you can barely pass a budget. Why are you even having these conversations about parental leave or whatever? 
like you you could you're 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 in a system that is increasingly non-functional and and the thing is like you know one of the most important models in the book is that like that is only going to increase dude i was watching canadian parliament go nuts and people were heckling basically i was yeah. like in an american court you would be thrown out if you heckled well, have you ever seen the British one? That's like it's like a it's like a, it's like a, a holdover from British. Like yeah. and even the the speaker was like, "You guys, cut it out!" Like they're trying to like it's twenty first century where adults don't scream over each other. They're but definitely it comes not from, adults. It yeah. they come from like British Parliament where they're trying to interrupt the the guy speaking. They're trying to disrupt them. And British Parliament it. is one of the great entertainments of, really of all time. I what mean, do they call they, it? The questions session? Or well, the, the Friday is, questions. Like, it's wonderful. The the question period, like the mm. the. The point of a parliamentary system, as opposed to the American system, is that there's a concept of the loyal opposition. So your job is to attack the government, whether you think they're right or not. And that's just when they're like, right. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, well, like, want to talk? So, like, <laughs> like and, and that and that creates that creates an environment where I do, where you know every leader has to be humiliated. Like, like every leader, every, every politician, no, everyone's just a servant. Right, and and that's and that that's that's just a completely different condition in the United States. Yeah, I, don't, I don't I don't system. know if we lost the point you were trying to make before, Daniel. No, I I I think it's 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 worth bringing back, not just because it's my point, but I think it, it touches on what you were saying of institutions. Um, so you mentioned uh, the, the Oath Keepers, and you we were also talking about Black Lives Matter in the sense of institutional uh, dysfunction and how I love that you said the right sees institutions is inherently necessary. Well, that's or or, or, net, or valuable. Um, well, as opportunities for advancement of their own program. Okay, we're, we're, like that's both sides now are sl are destroying the institution. Well, absolutely. But right. one of the things that I'm curious about is when you take a group that is, I think, in incredibly polemic and that does cause a lot of division, which is something like Black Lives Matter. Institutionally, they're they're golden. Right, you have Bank of America who writes them checks. You have the NBA. You have major institutions that support what I think is a purely political entity, hmm. but it is held up to this level, and I think that causes a lot of rage because w the Oath Keepers, regardless of what you think of them, would would Bank of America ever write them a check? They probably couldn't even get a loan well, at America Bank of America. So I think there's institutions have chosen sides, and I think that's leading to a great greater level of the of the of the division. Well, the money in American politics is really confusing yeah. because like for example like you saw the new york times article about dark money that came out like yeah. a week ago like i mean that to me is the most appalling story in american politics that i know of where the money that 2.4 billion dollars that decided the 2020 election no one knows where it came from some of it came from foreign sources for sure but nobody knows where it came from now 1.5 billion Came went to the Democrats and nine hundred thousand went to the Republicans, so nine hundred million. Sorry, nine hundred million. Yeah, um, did I say billion? billion. You said nine hundred thousand went to the oh, Democrats. Oh, right. Uh, my Canadian small time politics stuff. But uh, that's and and so you you and then there's the other fact that like while Republicans are pro business and so on, like seventy percent of American GDP comes from Biden voting counties. Mm. That seems to me like one of the key facts that's going to determine the future of this country in civil war or out of it or at the end of it. And so, like, I think there's that I, I will acknowledge. I, I find it confusing, mm. like where where money goes to where it is coming from, like where what it is supporting and what it wants. I find it confusing that certain political causes are are, are objectively uh, acceptance they're accepted to receive money or to be on the board or write a check to and others are not because those causes are aligning more and more well the Koch brothers wrote beliefs. a lot of checks i mean the um, Koch brothers wrote a coke a lot of checks. no they, coke they, they do no they do absolutely but i mean like, but, but you're you're never going to go to a a uh, uh a knicks game and at the halftime show have them give a, a five hundred thousand dollar check to this political cause but you will see it for something like Black Lives Matter. You will see it for something like Planned Parenthood. You will see. So the, 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 the philanthropy of politics, I think, has become very, very divisive because certain philanthrop philanthropic groups are, are, are tolerable and others and, are not. And real quick, yeah. uh, it's only one Koch brother, the other are right. cast. Right, sure, right. But um, just... Yeah. You know, I thought that was right. Well, they, I think they also stopped giving money to political causes too, oh. like a few years ago. Like there, I, think, there, there's, I think they give it to like uh, uh, like reform things. They just decided they're not doing partisan there, politics anymore. 
there are a lot of uh, wealthy individuals that are willing to fund either side. You know, Peter Thiel's well, got that's a lot of it. money and right. infrastructure. I mean, this, the, the, point, of money. the point yeah. is really not who is giving money to who. The point is, like, all this money is destroying the system mm. and making it inherently unstable. And There's also the politicization of everything, which is where you have homophobic chicken mm. and you have uh, <laughs> LGBTQ positive cookies or, or, yeah. or and, like, like you know like there where like literally every aspect of life yeah. is is politicized that also is classic prelude to civil war but this, this is right. an interesting point because um potentially what was the start of the culture war depending on who you asked uh, gamergate you're familiar mm -hmm. uh this is this was a lot of people who identified themselves as left libertarian on the political spectrum being angered that everything was becoming political because you had these uh, quote unquote news organizations, video game you know news and video game companies increasingly putting very specific ideologies in their games and people were upset with that. Right. So they would agree with you. Like, why are we politicizing everything? Please don't bring me into Gamergate, man. I mean, my, oh, life, is, my life is hard I, enough. I was playing Heroes of the Storm last night on Blizzard and I was like, if I type F the CCP, am I going to get banned off of Blizzard? Um. I didn't test it, but I was wondering. Well, there are certain things that, that YouTube banned, but, uh, you know, to the, to the point about, um, you know, politicizing everything. Yeah. Video games did used to have a lot of politics in them, but it was more of like background acceptable American views. When they started becoming very different, like, um, you know, uh, at, at core, like Marxist, uh, having some kind of like Marxist tinge to a lot of them. Or, what do you mean by Marxist? So like, see, I, I like, will say in America, that word has a meaning that I, I mean, don't I mean, understand. In, in the true sense of Marxist ideology of oppressed versus oppressor. Well, so like, okay, I would, I mean, like Marx, to me, Marxism is, there's lots of oppressed versus oppressor ideologies, but Marxism to me is strictly a class-based struggle. All other, right. uh, all other structures are invalidated. No, but that, that, that was a, a key point. I mean, I think around Occupy Wall Street, we had the very much yeah. class-based narrative of the 1% versus well, exactly. the Well, exactly. Occupy Wall Street to me is, cla is that's, that's a Marxist struggle. But Video games almost can't be. I mean, he rejects is that he had, he rejects any aesthetic category. Well, so are you familiar with the origins of critical race theory? Yeah, but that's not. I mean, to me, that's that's not Marxism. I mean, you know, I, I think it. I think it has come. It has come to mean something in this country that I, I just don't recognize in my own, like in my own readings of Marxism in my own readings of. I've certainly con like to me that that's a that's an identity politics formulation which is a completely separate thing. Well, when from it comes Marxism. to like Roblox, you want to talk about video games no, 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 enslaving no, no, no. On, people in a class based no, no, system. No, that's what it is. Totally off subject. Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> critical race theory, specifically, Kimberly Crenshaw wrote that Marx didn't understand American racial politics and that the idea of oppressed versus oppressor can't just be class based when race is inherently tied to class. Right. Uh, yeah, but I mean that's inherently a rejection of Marxism. Right. Like, I mean, yeah, Mark, yeah, yeah. right. Like that, like Marx is so, like in the so, Jewish question, he says, you know, there are there there are no there are in effect no ethnicities. All there is is class. So I, th I think. So to the, me, the, like, you know, like th this whole it's, reading it's a, of Marxism. It's a semantic issue, though, is what I would say. I guess so. But like, it does seem to me pretty important that like th this because because Marxism conjured so much evil in the world. Right. Like because it because it conjured so many totalitarian regimes Like to call something Marxist to me is like. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate insult because it was ultimately so evil, right? Yeah. And for like, that's not what uh, that's well, not me, what applies me, to me, these me, other forms. Let me right? let me let me bring you there. So uh, I went down to Occupy Wall Street on like day three, and right, you were it, right. Yeah. So you know, I ended up streaming and stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, it it started out with conservatives, libertarians, liberals, and leftists all in one place saying we very much oppose the bailouts, the corruption in the system, the revolving door policies. In the first week, there was so much talk about these big banks got bailed out. The, the guy who works for the pharmaceutical companies gets a job with the FDA. The guy from the, the war machine, Halliburton, becomes the vice president. It's a revolving yes, door. Sure. But within about two weeks, critical race theory took over. And all of a sudden, you couldn't speak at their assemblies if you were a white man. And if you wanted to speak, or I should say you're at the bottom of the list on their progressive stack. Right. So it started out as... In, uh, essentially Marxist, the, the class-based oppression, yeah. quickly turned into a bunch of intersectionalists, critical race theorists coming in and saying, no, no, you guys don't understand. Race is actually the core component. And then all of a sudden the narrative there shifted, the libertarians and conservatives left. And that this was one of the, start, the starting points, at least in the culture war that I've experienced. Yeah. Where 
Well, I, this is when I'm talking about took over. when I'm talking about self defeating left wing politics. Like this is what As I'm talking example. about. Yeah. Like like it, like what is required from the left now more than ever in a complete sense is solidarity, and it is completely incapable of providing that even on the most basic levels, right? And that's why to me like. Because my, my book, what my book is about is about collapsing systems, right? And and how systems collapse. And like what is causing the collapse of systems. And the left is actually too weak to cause the collapse of the system because it eats itself in five minutes. That's why Occupy Wall Street mm. went nowhere. It, but that's technically not true. Well, Occupy Wall Street resulted in a massive shift of wealth from for-profit to credit unions. And it resulted in, I think the Democratic Party pulled their money out of Bank of America and moved it to Amalgamated, which is a union-operated bank. Oh, yeah? So, uh, I'll, there, How much was that? Uh, the DNC's funds. I don't know. What the, I can't remember. It was right. mil- tens of millions, maybe. You well, probably tens of millions. I mean, like, but, we're I mean, talking about the United for, States of America. But it's, it's, it's a big, uh, you know, you, you plant the seed of a cultural shift, and that, and that matters. So when, yeah. I, when I look at Occupy Wall Street and I see the rise of what was effectively a form of, I think it was overtly critical race theory, it then makes its way into something bigger, into media, it expands. That was the first experience I had with it. It was kind of a crazy experience to see how racist they were. I mean, overtly separating people into different racial categories to make them vote on policy was insane. Do you think you would qualify as someone who was, comp- like the process of complementary radicalization would apply to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. that's interesting. So, uh, so however, but how do you, like, how do you negotiate that? I'm, I'm curious. There's like, do you like, because you know, the way that they think about it, the way that the experts that I talk to think about it is like a, a, an inverse pendulum. So like as a pendulum swings, you know, it tends to the center, but in American politics, it tends, the energy sends it to more extreme forms, right? We're, we're not seeing the same level of, ex- of extremism on the right as we are on the left. Oh, I disagree. I mean, I would have to disagree with you there. Mm. Like, I mean, you, you see, there's there's all kinds of right wing extremism. I mean, there's and 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 the other well, thing so, about so, extremism well, on the right is also way better armed. Well, let's 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 talk about some examples. January sixth, we got that's a big one for sure. <laughs> well, there you go. But what else? What the Oath Keepers list: forty thousand people. Well, what did they do? What have they done? Well, January sixth. I but, mean, but look, January sixth, you had uh, eight hundred people. Well, I mean, certainly, like, they're... Relatively disorganized. Okay, well, the the extreme right in the United States is, of course, really hard to figure out. Um, You know, the way I think of it is as a, um, like, a smorgasbord of ideologies, some that are completely incompatible, and some that are... So there's... It's true for the left, too. Oh, the left is totally chaotic. Yeah, it's all... Right, like, it's... like Like, I, I... I mean, for my own sake, I think we can just dismiss the left as a as a force, right? Because it, in, in America, because it is so disorganized and it eats itself, right? Um, so when, what you see on the right is like there are sovereign citizens, there are three percenters, there are uh, you know uh, oath keepers, there there are sagebrush rebels, there are uh, you know um, Second Amendment absolutists, there are tax evasion people, there are tax but, avoidance people. So there's what a whole. They, what have they done? Well, of the political murders of every year, which are amount to like about 70 on average since 2015, uh, I think the, the number, don't quote me because it's, it's in the book and I don't have it on my fingertips, but I think it's like 72% are, are far right. And like 7% are far left and the middle is like various. So, so but- like I, I would say like when I talk to the experts, um, the the fear of political violence is is much clearer from the right, and that's why I said I feel like the far right is more sharp. Right when they do take action, yeah, it's extreme. Well, you know, we're also dealing. I think we should acknowledge this because we are all trying to stay human beings here. Is that we're dealing with a lot of people who are on the line between mental illness and yeah. political affiliation. We're dealing with a lot of people who are criminal, who are just simply criminals and use politics as a cover for their violence. And like that has to be acknowledged too, right? And that this and that this political radicalization gives them cover for mental illness and for and, and for their violence, right? Let, so th- those things all like, to, you know, also those numbers like to be clear are not from the FBI. 
they're from they're from they're from journalist reporting organizations who are going through newspapers to figure out what are violent crimes. and they're defining so me, who's far me, right and who's yeah far right. It, well they're they're trying to pick up the pieces mm. but honestly this this work has not been done at a government level it's only and it's let, been done at an academic but level. see it's I wanna, not I wanna, ideal. I want to get back to that point because I don't think we got a chance to flesh it out yeah so my my point was that um, there's uh, substantially more far left polarization and extremism compared to the right and I'll and I'll to, to make my point. Let, let me ask you a question. If, uh-huh. if you went to a, uh, uh, would you fear violence against you at a right wing rally? Um, I've got, I've always gotten along really well with far right people. Like I quite like them. Like I, like I, 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 um, but I, just, I, just real quick for the sake of argument, you, you wouldn't really. Oh, de- I definitely would. You, you, well, there. I mean, when you go to a far right rally, there are many, many people walking around with large weapons. I don't know what a far but, right rally well, is. So, 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 just you know, uh, I've been on the ground for. Uh, uh, I went on the ground for maybe about also, eight years. Also, I, I look like this. I mean, I'm like a, I'm like a white dude from Alberta. So you'd, you'd you'd be more likely to get attacked by the far left. Well, I don't. I've never felt threatened by the far left. Now, um, you know. Let I'll me, give you. I'll give you a specific give, example. Let me give you an example. Like I, I attended the 2016 inauguration. I covered it for a Canadian magazine. Uh, the what I fear genuinely is not really either side. It's when the two sides are together. Uh, the, like the, that's the, what's Donald, scary. D- Donald Trump's inauguration. Yeah. Donald there Trump's were there were about 400 black clad leftists smashing windows, starting fires, and and attacking people in the streets. Yeah. There, there were there were plenty of far right groups there too. But they weren't doing anything. Well. They were sort of triumphantly there too. Well, there was there was some violence, but I, I would say that the atmosphere of menace, like you're you're just asking me my feelings, right? So so it's just you know it's my personal experience, but there's also a really but great. But you example. look like you looked him. I mean, like if you were if you were a black woman and you were at a far right rally, I think that would be a completely different thing. And like that, that's one of the things that I've always found like. But far I've, right I've people not, get along I've with me very, that. very well. Like I like talking to them. They're uh, like they're they're nice guys. Like on, like honestly, like they're they're want, they're, want, per, they're you, perfectly polite. You want to know what I saw in Portland? I saw yes, the far Portland left was, yeah. screaming the N word over and over again at right wingers. I saw the Proud Boys with a bunch of different people of different races. And there was a black Proud Boy who was walking down the street, and Antifa was screaming incessantly the N word at him. I've I've been on the ground at all these things. Daryl Davis. We familiar? have very different experiences of these things. For sure. Are you familiar with Daryl Davis? No, I don't know who that is. He's the black jazz musician who he decided, you know, he thought to himself one day, how could someone hate me if they don't know me? So he started going to Klan meetings. <laughs> oh, he, yes. That and guy. He, yeah, he, he's and, fantastic. And, and, yeah. and we booked him to speak at an event called Ending, what was it called? Ending Violence, uh, uh, Racism, and Authoritarianism. He was our keynote, our headline speaker to talk about de-radicalization Antifa threatened to burn the theater down, so they canceled on us. The, the, the after show venue refused to back down. So Antifa came and protested. And he said, look, guys, don't worry. I'm going to go talk to him. And when he went out there, they started screaming at him, chanting at him, and wouldn't let him speak. He wrote a Facebook post, which went viral, where he said, I've never experienced anything like this, that I was able to go and talk to Klan members as a black man, but he couldn't even talk to these leftist activists outside without them screaming at him. Well, look, all I can tell you is... The experts I talk to, the people that study this stuff, are much more afraid of the right than the left. Now, could it be that they are on the left? Well, I w- they're from foreign countries. So, so, so the answer is yes. They well, are I guess on the so. Left. I guess so. I mean, <laughs> if like, they're from Belgium, yes, they're on the left. Well, they're from I, I think. See, I'm going to go back Oslo. to. I'm going to go back to one thing you said. I think if you went to, I haven't been to a far right rally. I've been to Trump rallies. Um, my experience have been has been that if you are a black woman, people will go so much further out of their way to be accommodating because they want to demonstrate that much more that they are not racist because they have been pinned by the left as you are a Trump person, you must be a racist. Can I just? And say, I think I find that amazing that 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 that's what has to be done. But that is what happens. Don't you think the time has come? to stop asking yourselves who is more to blame and start figuring out either how do we reconcile this or how do sure. we come to some kind of conclusion sure. that is not violent. I mean, you're, you're talking about like 
all of this stuff. Like you're like look yeah. at you're you're getting yourselves really angry about this. Oh stuff. god, no, no. And I don't no, no. not in the slightest bit angry. No, no, no. Look, I, 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 no, no, no. I that's can, not fair. Look, that, can, just because it's a heated like, conversation. No, 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 no. Listen, angry. listen. I'm not I, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying like the point of this book is really that the moment has come where you have to ask yourself how do we get ourselves out of this cycle yeah. of I, of those people are awful. Oh, we're all people. Are, our people are awful. But that's in response. Like that's the, the crisis that is facing you is no longer one of who is right. We but like, how do you how do you work out these structures into a way well, here's that a, is civilized well, well, and, 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 and that is civilized and is you're killing. Me. And <laughs> I know the answer. You got to give them something to live for, and you got to unify people. I just it, with a with an idea. Civil war is the it. worst thing that can happen. Oh, for sure. Civil Death war, is the worst. No, no. Like, being negative. conquered by a foreign country is nothing compared to civil war. It's the yeah. like like it's, and, the, it's it's the worst thing that can happen to a country. It's a China, disaster. China will can come I, in if this escalates. So, uh, well, you're gonna need like. In part of the book, I'm like imagining what it would be like to have a negotiated settlement with the United States, which would have to be internationally mo monitored. And we love that in this country. <laughs> yeah, um, we, lo I mean, we love what, foreigners. What would love? What so, would America love more than so, Chinese peacekeepers on the ground? Again, I have my States. bias, and I am very well aware that I have my bias. So, so no bones about it. But so go after me. But let me make my point. Yeah. So you said when you talk, when you look at political assassinations or political murders, mm -hmm. based on you said those numbers were based on journalists who dig into well, assassination is a separate question. Not assassination, murders, political violence. political violence, and you they were done based on journalists who dug into the story and read it. In five years from now, if a journalist reads an op-ed in the Las Vegas Post, which talked about um, um, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, attempted murder in Louisville, they called him a right-wing Trump supporter, basically. They said that this is the cause of right-wing violence. And they said, although he is not, and if you read the op-ed, and I sent it to Lydia because I was so apoplectic, yeah, if, you, if you, as of now, he has not been identified to any right-wing groups, but... This is Trump violence. This is this is even, an editorial even, in the Las Vegas Sun after it came out that he was a Black Lives Matter activist. So you want to say to that editorial board, what are you doing? But right? like, why are you writing a story saying this is a right wing extremist who shot a Jewish, tried to kill a Jewish man running for, for mayor when all of the evidence there says I, I get, he is a left wing radical? But, I, but I'll answer that. Yeah, uh, and then I want to make make uh, answer a point you made. Is I don't want to hear your answer to my question because, like, I think you're a very interesting case of somebody who has lived through complementary radicalization, and I would like to know how you see escaping from it. There isn't an escape, uh, but the the uh, to your point, there, it's a conflict. Yeah, they're going to say what they need to say to support their side by any means by any means necessary, and so you actually have groups called like by any means necessary. The reason why there is no escape. So you asked me if um, I am, uh, I forgot how to phrase it, but like if I am subject to complimentary. Well, I, I, I'm curious. Like, I don't know if I, like, I don't know you, but I would like, I, I, you seem to me like the, you would fit into that category that I've seen sociologists describe. I mean, maybe that's not fair. And if it's not, please tell me. No, no, it, but, it, it, it is without a doubt. But um, I don't, I, I think the, the issue at hand is, What's what's the best example to give? Um, the truckers in in Canada are a really great example. I supported Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. their right to protest. I interviewed people on the ground. I defended um, Extinction Rebellion when they blocked the streets in in D.C. and put up a boat and said we demand to be heard. When Ron DeSantis was working in Florida on the anti riot law, I said yeah. it is wrong to make it a felony to block a road. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. See, I'm the opposite. I want them all banned. But, well, so, anyway. so, so, but here's what happens. The same people that I met 10 years ago who defended the right to occupy streets are now opposed to it in Ottawa. Well, so, so, Ottawa is a very different situation because it's been going on for three weeks. But. And Occupy Wall Street went on for two months. Well, I was supposed to Occupy Wall Street. Too, and you also had the Chaz and the Chop. You also had Minneapolis. But it's not about your yes. views. It's not about your views. Right. It's about the fact that yeah, yeah. We, have, we have in this country two parent factions. Within those parent factions, we describe them as left and right. It's fairly nebulous. You have several smaller groups. Many of them don't like each other. Mm -hmm. Antifa people don't like Democrats. But no, often they're, they hate them. But their politics do align sometimes. Well, barely. 
but but institutionally, right? So the Democrats support Black Lives Matter to try and earn votes, which then gives funding to say the federal government gave funding for for COVID relief that the Illinois government then gave directly to Black Lives Matter. I believe it was three hundred thousand dollars. That would never happen with the Oath Keepers. That would never happen with the Proud Boys. In fact, the Proud Boys get called terrorists and evil and demonized. So here, here's my point. When you look at civics data, civics, if you're, not, if you're not familiar, they're a polling organization that have a massive map, a time spread going back like five years of all these different issues. You can see that independent voters, people who are unaffiliated right now, overwhelmingly agree with the right when it comes to well, issues of the economy, when it comes to issues of job uh, presidential performance, when it comes to black lives. But matter. you know why that is, right? Why is that? Because there are no independent voters in America anymore. It's only about 7%. I think the last one is a 4%. Like, so, so a lot of people is, on the right call themselves independent. But when, like, if you talk about like voting behavior, like people who actually shift, like vote Democrat sometimes and vote Republican sometimes, that, that percentage in America is well, well, negligible. On. It's always been negligible. Yes, and that's indep- true. And independent voters have always somewhat leaned Democrat. Republicans would win if they could convince just enough to move over the other side. Republicans call themselves independent on a much higher level. That's but, why that number is that But way. what we're seeing now with Pew data is that there's a, a specific graph showing hyperpolarization. Mm. And you have a larger portion of Democrats becoming Republican, independents becoming Republican, than the inverse. So here's what I see. I see my views mostly unchanged on principle, save the Second Amendment. Since uh, the past in the past several years, I went from moderate to a we should respect people's rights, but maybe have some gun control. Now I'm just outright. It, you got to change the Constitution before you can do any of this stuff. Second Amendment, Second Amendment. That's chapter five. So uh, but you, you, you know, to have um, in this country, people who are uninformed on policy or, or a specific industry try to regulate it and then fail repeatedly. That's exactly why one of the reasons my positions on this changed. Right. So when I say something like. Yes, I see what you mean. But so so, so, so let me explain the the complementary radicalization. Please. It's not that my positions have become far right. It's not that my positions have become increasingly conservative. Nope. I've always been pro-choice for much the same. In fact, I used to be further left when I was 18. Then I became fairly liberal and I've remained there, save uh, gun rights. I became a little bit more libertarian. The issue is that the other side is increasingly becoming authoritarian. The left is, in, is increasingly embracing uh, ins, insane tactics that are destabilizing the system. And then, of course, I do watch the right respond in turn. Now, this is a storm. There is no way out of it. But I'll be damned if I'm going to give up my principles to try and negotiate with psychopaths. So when I say something... But you, you just acknowledge. Like, see, this to me seems to be a key point. You're like, well, the right responds the same way. So surely you've got to get to a point in your country or just for your own soul, where you're like, the psychopaths are everywhere. We need to find a way out from the psychopaths. It's not just, the problem is not just the other side psychopaths. It's all of the psychopaths. Well, so let me put it this way. If a guy comes in, if if I'm in the middle of a field and I watch two guys and one guy's like hanging out with this kid and they're playing catch. And then some dude in a black mask walks up and punches him in the back of the head. He turns around and starts fighting. I'm not going to be like, oh, no, a fight. Can we please compromise? I'm going to be like, that dude punched that guy. Arrest him. Arrest him. That guy's defending himself. But you know somewhere there's some guy who's in a left-leaning podcast who thinks exactly the same thing except from the other side. And he's wrong. He thinks, but he's, not, I mean, like, does it matter? It does. So I, look, I don't think it matters. Well, well, listen, Joe Biden, right? It is. Joe Biden is not the source of this. No, 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 no. But I'll give you an example. Joe Biden, uh, based on all available journalism and research we've done, engaged in a very serious criminal act with Ukraine. We have reporting from The New York Times. We have report. We have his own statements. We've got uh, Matt Taibbi's reporting. We have sworn affidavits out of Ukraine from Viktor Shokin. As opposed to the fully legal activities of Donald Trump. Well, give me a specific example. Of like I'm, I'm Donald sp- Trump's I'm, illegal. I mean, he's about I'm, to be charged. Don't make the York mistake process. of creating false binaries. Biden well, and Trump have nothing I'm, to do with each I'm other. I'm specifically <laughs> citing Joe Biden taking a very specific action with, with respect to Ukraine that any reasonable person can look at the journalism coming out of this and be like, wow, what he did there. Now, look, by all means, cr- call out Donald Trump for any criminal activity he may have done. But everyone seems to do it. He seems to be in the hot seat 24-7. He was under investigation for a hoax. The Russiagate hoax was just not true. But that doesn't happen to the, to the establishment Democrat side or the leftists. Black Lives Matter engages in, in, in wanton destruction in some of the smallest towns in this country, over $2 billion in damage. 
and you and you'll and your perspective is the right is more dangerous. I yeah, just some, it's I not really it. my perspective. I, I would say that would be the general pers- perspective of s- experts on civil war and the conditions of the United States. I mean, For that sure. those For are sure. the models that I'm working from. Right. Like, but I would say, like, surely you can see that these these sides that each side has a case and that they and that the problem here is not the problem here is not that you know what has happened but the fact that there's no way for anyone you know democracies only work when if you lose your side the other side is still valid right like that those are the conditions that uh, th- those are the only those are the conditions of democracy didn't it, and so that like what you're saying to me is what and what i hear is that um that's no longer possible and that's yes. That's really what the book is about. And that is like, I'm kind of like, I'm imploring you as a neighbor. This is a book written out of love. This is not, this is not a book written out of contempt mm. for the United States. This is a book written out of profound love for the United States. This is, this is someone who has, I've lived in the United States. I've worked there. I have a lot of American friends. I have my Trump voting cousin in Seattle. Like, you know, I've got like, I've, I, I, I feel a kin, you know, I think Canada has a kinship relationship with America. Where we're, you know, Northrop Fry, the great literary, Canadian literary critic, said that a Canadian is an American who rejects the revolution. And I think that's largely true, right? Quebec the, was asked. They Quebec, said no. They said no very close, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, like, the other thing is, I come we from... We almost a, took Montreal well, in 1812. I, no, you had the worst general in the world. <laughs> you had the terrible, <laughs> terrible general in, in 1812. The real danger was 1860. But... Yeah. Um, where well, was I? Let, let, I now have completely well, lost my train sorry of thought. To, my, my point, though, is that like, as someone who is concerned for your country and as someone who wants you to have a stable country, like, you are going to have to get to a point where this is, you either come to some kind of divorce, which seems to me like a, at this, when, when a marriage reaches the point that the United States is at, you say, you'd sit the kids down and say, like, it's over. But, or, but that will lead to violence. Well, I don't think there's a way to avoid violence at this right. point. The question is, how do we get out let of me, it? You let, can, you well, can, let me, let me ask you a question. Stop focusing about, on the psychopaths and the, start focusing on what's causing psychopathy. Because well, if you try and wipe out the psychopaths, it's, they're just going to keep appearing. Exactly. It's but like let, trying to let, drown let me, a vampire in blood. Hold, but let me, let me ask you uh, to, then. Um, you want to end the conflict. Okay. What well, I well, want so, so, is for well, Americans well, to survive as a democracy. All right. So That is what I want, very specifically. How do you feel about your health care system in Canada? I love it. Okay. Get rid of that and go fully private. We got a deal. Yeah, no. You, wait, wait, no, 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 no. You have to compromise with me. Right. Will you give up your your state fund, your state? You know, that's a system? fair point. You see, make it. So you make it. You make, that, that's that's fair. I'm sitting here. I see what you mean. I'm sitting here with people telling me that. Uh, so so uh, uh, I'm going to go right into the stereotype for everybody who's listening. I come from a second generation mixed race family. Okay. They fought in my my, my my grandparents were forced to flee numerous states because it was illegal to cohabitate and to have kids. This is something my family experienced. I grow up, once again, with my mom, who's mixed race, marrying a white guy and having a second generation mixed race family. And I genuinely believed when I was a kid, growing up in Chicago, like we had, we had come to this position where we recognized race was less important. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. I was gonna, it didn't matter what I was or my, my Latino friend or my Asian friend. We were all just friends in the neighborhood. And then I got to experience critical race theory. And these people looked me in the eyes and said, I don't know what you are, so you're not allowed to to be in any of these groups. But all the white people go there, the black people go there, the Asians go there, and the Mexicans go there. That's what they did at Occupy Wall Street. They were called spokes, the spokes council. And they said there were uh, working groups and there were caucuses. And the caucuses were race-based and gender-based. And so they quite literally said, if you want to vote on how we spend money, All the black people have to go in the group of black people and decide how black people want money spent. And I said, that's insane. And I will fight against that tooth and nail because my family experienced this. In this past election in California, they tried to repeal their civil rights amendment from their constitution. I ask you, you say that we've got to come to this position where we come together. Would you be willing to allow a bunch of white people in a majority white state to discriminate against black people in the name of peace? You know, I don't think I'm going to be faced with that question. And certainly the world is perplexing to me enough without what ifs. But I'd actually like to ask you a question because I don't I don't know the answer to this, even after I spent five years writing this thing. Like, how do you think this is going to end? I, don't, I, I mean, you, I've heard you say there's going to be a civil war. I think we're in a civil war. 
I mean, I think yeah. you're well. You're literally in civil strife. Yeah. Civil like, strife. like in in a, in a tech in a technical sense, like you are already technically in civil strife. And that was twenty seven deaths per year or something. No, like it's twenty five. But uh, like America's a funny country. Like America's so big and so diverse and so geographically huge that those numbers are probably not as meaningful as they are in the rest of the world. But on the other hand. I think we're in agreement, right? And is it, is it like, an older metric? Like when? No, more... it's a standard metric, but it's still not. It like, you know, America's America's different, right? Like America is a very different place. Like I don't think America is an exception. I don't think the laws of political gravity don't apply to the United States. But it, like, it, when you're applying these standards, it's just a little it's just a little more complicated than it would be for Canada, right? Um, but on the other hand, like, how do you actually? So you you think that. Do you think political violence is going to become normalized? That there's just going to be a lot more assassination? Do you think there's going to be? Do you think there's going to be street fights? Do you, like I there, can't, all of those things. I can't happening. foresee a scenario in like you know one of the problems here is that by 2040, uh, 50 percent of the country will control 85 percent of the Senate, right? So this is like this becomes like this is classic anocracy. So you know civil wars tend to happen in. Like civil wars don't happen in full democracies like Denmark, and they don't happen in autocracies like Russia. They happen when there's a in the gray area, right? In this in this area where it's unclear whether it's democracy or autocracy. The, so, do you think like I can't foresee a scenario where there will be an uncontested election ever in the United oh, States? Oh, you're you're completely correct. I right. mean, going back to to uh, uh, since uh, uh, Gore and Bush. It's yeah. Just, it's just been, and and even then, you still had uh, certain some degree of, of of strife and insanity with previous elections, but it was really bad starting then. Um, the, I, there's there's a bunch of different ways I, I I see this. I don't think the right wants to control the left, but the left does want to control the right. So the well, right, the right wants to control the country. I disagree. I think, so you think the right would be happy with just the states controlling their own. Because, I mean, one one answer to this is radical defederalization. Yes. I mean, that's something that's been talked well, we, about. But, but we, on are, the left, we are supposed to be radically defederalized. Yeah, I mean. We're not. Well, you but, already but, I are. Mean, but, no, but, but, but we're not, we're, we're right. not de facto. But we're compared, not. compared we're to other countries. We're supposed to be radically defederalized. Compared to other countries, like compared to any country in Europe, compared to anywhere in Asia, uh. like you are radically defederalized. As you were right. traveling the country writing this, geographically, did you find intensity in certain areas? Well, um, I'm just curious, like, because like, it what is do you a mean big by country. Intensity? As you were traveling the country writing this book, when you were in State X, where you were like, wow, I really feel a, 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 a burgeoning civil war here. New York City. I'm from New York City. No. I, uh, Texas. Not to knock Texas. Did you go to any region that you were like, these people are ready to be separated I from found their it, friends? I found it everywhere. Really? I, yeah. I mean, it, it was extraordinary to me the, the where I would find it. Like, my friends who are in media in the Hudson Valley, they feel very much under threat. Like they feel, they feel like if you run for dog catcher as a Democrat in Hudson Valley, someone will send you a picture of a gun saying we're coming for you, right? Like, never mind. But I mean, the thing about America right now is that everyone feels under siege, mm. right? Like everyone but feels so under siege from one kind or another, whether it's cultural siege, whether it's political siege, whether it's siege from the political machinery, right? That's the extraordinary thing, right? I'm going to talk to you guys. You all feel under mm. siege. Yeah. I feel under go, siege I'm, with, I'm, the, I'm uh, go varying degrees. with, with the varying degrees. With the censorship algorithm for, on I mean, what you described. Like, they're trying to take... They're, they're hitting me in the back of the head in an open field. And, well, no, no, and no. They're, gotta, they're trying to tell me to you understand. live in a segregated world. Exactly. Yeah. And I will go and I will go and talk to Black Lives Matter organizers, which I have also done, and they will, they will say exactly the same thing. Yeah, but, they will say, they but, will say but, literally... Exactly the same thing, and they're lying to you. But <laughs> and that's, but, 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 and that's but see, what they say see, about you. Yes, exactly. And 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 when Russia Gate was a hoax, when the Covington kids was a hoax, when Jesse Smollett was a hoax, at a certain point, don't you say to yourself, maybe they're lying to me? Well, then there's the, you know, then there's January sixth. Then there's then there's Trump calling up the tanks in Washington on the fourth of July. Well, well, then well, there's, well, well, what is that? What is that? Well, on the Fourth of July, when no. the when, in, on Washington. doing a parade, yeah, but, like, but, no. but but hold on, hold on. Oh, sorry, am I not close enough yeah, to the mic? Stick with but like, there, that's I not mean, a lie. Jan listen, January six was. If you're gonna make, I I don't do the rage. So yeah. if you want to have someone on to explain to you the well, no, crimes no, 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 no. of the right, like if, if, if you if can I'm definitely cite, find a lot of if, people. If I'm gonna cite overt widespread lies 
And then you cite January 6th, which is unrelated to what I was talking about. I'm going to ask you. Oh, I think you're asking. Well, I, I mean, if I were to count Trump's lies. You got, that, you that, got, that's a lo- I mean, how many hours do we have here? Like, but, but, like but, I mean, if we're going to if we're going to talk about the, the lies of the right, like any Trump speech has 30 of them. Yeah, I don't like but, but I don't hold like on, hold comparing on, hold on. Trump and Biden. I'm They're talking, both authoritarian. I'm talking about I'm not talking about one guy. Trump is a symptom of this. This anger I actually this, say that in the book, you know, he's, he's a symptom rather than a cause. For right. Sure. So mm. when you have but if you're talking about if you're asking me, like, are there any right wing people who lie? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you, you would say that Black Lives Matter would accuse me of lying. And my yes. response is. Jesse Smollett, that thing was an obvious lie, but it was picked up by actors and celebrities and every mainstream news organization. Russia Gate was three, four years of outright lying. Ukraine Gate, all of it turned out to be lies. Hands up, don't shoot, another lie. The Covington kids, another lie. Eleven How- Trump associates have been indicted. But indictments don't mean anything other than people are at war with each other. John Durham is investigating them the same as they're investigating him. What I'm talking about is... Are you really going to argue with me? Are you actually going to say that the Trump administration was an honest administration? You don't believe that. I didn't say that. Okay, so so, you would admit that they're lying. Oh, absolutely. Well, there we go. But my point is, Trump is... uh, How how many viewers does the right command in terms of institutional media? 10 million relative to well, Fox News is the biggest news organization in the country what, by far, except they only get about like 3 million. in total. Well, yeah, I mean, time. we're in media breakdown. This is actually a, actually a large part of the structure too, like the information breakdown. That's also a big part of the book. So, but like it's that's actually that's a, you know, when I talked about a complex cascading system, that's that feeds into both sides in, in different ways, in asymmetrical ways. But um, but, you, you know, like one one way of thinking thinking about this struggle is that it is a mimetic struggle in the Jeff Jezea, you know, so, so de- definition of it. Here, here's the point I'm trying to get to. Um, if you look at the politically homeless faction, the intellectual dark web faction, the post liberal faction, yes, conservatives and even hardcore MAGA Trump supporters, they all agree for the most part on a typical worldview, except for certain like Q elements, which don't make up that many people. I, 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 I don't think I can really agree with that. I mean, I really tried. I mean, maybe it is my own failing, but I mean, part of my job was trying to figure out like what are the intellectual coherences that you find in this. And I found that, I mean, one of the things I find really interesting about the American right in general is their, um, their love of esoteric information. Right, like an esoteric knowledge, where like something becomes more valuable because it's less believed. But what's that, an example of that? If you have one. Well, QAnon would be like the ultimate example. But where it's like not it, prominent? I mean, you have QAnon is pretty powerful. I mean, there's two Congress. There's 50 people going to run in 2022 who are QAnon. But what does supporters. that mean? Well, uh, 50, 50 members of the Republican Party support QAnon. They're going to run in See, here, here's, here's the issue I think you might have. We've had Marjorie Taylor Greene on the show. Yeah. And she's, she's set, rejected all of that stuff. So when you don't actually... Have the you, space lasers and so on. That's not true, actually. That's, fa- that's a lie. Ah. Right? So if you, if you base your perception off a, a faction that is lying to you nonstop, of course you're going to believe, well, the both sides must be bad. Marjorie Do you Taylor, not understand that I've had this, com- this exact conversation with people on the left? And I've, mm-hmm. a- I've, I've actually stated exactly this in 100 plus shows of this, that, that the reason civil war, in my opinion, is inevitable is because you have two sides both saying, I'm right. And I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example, a riddle. Uh, you may have heard this one. This will be fun for all the kids at home. Don't tell me. I want to guess. You come across, you're walking down a road, yeah. and you come to a fork in the road, and you see there's, there's two paths, and, uh, and, and you know that one's, one road will lead you to a minute death, and one road will lead you to safety. There are two men standing on each side. Oh, yes, the old one, and how do you know? Yeah. One always tells the truth. One always right. tells a lie. I know how this do you, one. How do you know? I which, heard it differently. Which road is the, is the right what path is to take? it? Oh, God, I know it. You asked. <laughs> well, I've, heard it go, as, right? as, 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 I've heard it as heaven and hell. Yeah. Where one, the angel always tells the truth and the devil always tells a lie. And you ask the devil. No, no. You ask the angel, is the other one a devil? You, you don't know which one is which. Shit, I can't remember. Oh, you, that's fine. You want me to give you the answer? Yeah, I can't remember it. I've heard it before. You ask either one of them what the other would say. Right. And then take the opposite and path. And take the opposite path. Yeah. So, so the, the issue here is there, there is obviously a, a, more, a more complex system of variables here. Well, that's my point. But right, like I, that's, I, that's, that's actually a really good way of putting it. 
It's so, like, so if, if that's the condition where one's the angel and one's the devil and you don't know which one is right, like surely we have to come up with something more clever than the other side's wrong. I, I suppose the issue is, um, the reason I use the Biden example is because if you were to ask the average journalist in this country, did Joe Biden engage in a quid pro quo in Ukraine? They will tell you no. But the actual answer is yes, he did. I, I think journalists actually are pretty complicated. I mean, I know a lot of them. You know, as I said, I'm a freelance writer. So one of the advantages I have is that I go into a lot of shops. I'm like a stray cat. Like I go into the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and New York or the Atlantic and so on. Like, And I, I would say that the, the general opinion that the American media are all the same, that's not, that's not necessarily true. What is true is that people who went to Ivy League schools tend to be tend to have a a very similar outlook on, on life mm. these these organizations these, uh, most of them are in New York or they tend to be in big cities where they're surrounded yes. by like-minded people I would say but, they're they're only as far me, as I know they're only in New York Washington and LA but but let me, let me ask you to because uh, I think the best example is the Biden thing were you aware that Joe Biden engaged in a criminal quid well, pro quo I'm not sure I would define it that way but also I'm not sure I have that whole story. So this like, is, and, 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 you know, when I don't like, uh, there's a lot why, of things. Why don't you? You know, I, I was with the a president. Bunch of, well, there was a bunch of, I was at a, I was at a cottage with these friends I have who are in their eighties. And one guy told me in a really, he, they were all giving me life advice. And this old dude said, you know, one of the most important things in life is to know you don't have to have an opinion on everything. You don't have to think I know the answer to X when you don't. And the, so I actually go through life not knowing the answer to almost everything. And so when I write books, what I try and do is figure out exactly what I do know. And like and, and like and, well, and also be clear about where I got my knowledge. Let me, so let me ask I, you though. like I don't like what happened with Biden in the Ukraine, I don't know. Shouldn't you though? I mean if you're writing about a civil war and there have been accusations made up against Donald Trump in terms of a quid pro quo. Well, I don't remember, to- Donald Trump does not figure in this book. Well, like, I, I, like, I, like, I, like, neither does Biden. Like, to me, honestly, horse race politics, irrelevant. Yeah. Like, like horse race, like what Marjorie Taylor Greene said, what Ted Cruz said today, irrelevant. Like, so, the structural problems that the United States faces are so profound that the, all of the politics, to me, that consumes everything in, it, it is all irrelevant. Like, it, it, it really, really does not matter. The, the, the reason I bring it up is just um, to try and set, like, a baseline. So yeah. uh, I, I started uh, covering Occupy Wall Street. I had worked. I, I'd been an activist in my younger years. I worked for nonprofits. I go to Occupy Wall Street. I start documenting things. And I say, I just want to show people what's happening. I end up getting a job at Vice and being the founding member of Vice News. We're right. Doing on-the-ground reporting in Ukraine and Brazil and Venezuela. And then from there, I went and joined ABC Univision's joint venture, once again, trying to do news. But... That's where they got hyper polarized. They within six months of me being there, they said, we're far left. That's our that's our pitch. Right. We are targeting progressive young people. Oh, as a freelancer, you think I don't see that? But so institutions all the time that I'm part of suddenly become hyper polarized. But it's always to the left. Well, what, what it, institutions? yes, it, no, that you're fair. That's fair. So here's it, so, that, it, they almost always go hyper polarized left. That's so, true. So, so here's and then ha- they immediately die. Like that's the other thing. Vice's evaluation, right? Right. Like they, like they go. That's what one of my points about the left is. Like once you, once an institution becomes woke, it almost immediately starts. That's dying. my fear but about so the Federal me, Reserve, me, man. I, I want to make this point. Slow. So I, I got him. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm guys, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. No, you. I know. I'm, just, I'm talking a lot this one, but I do want to make this point: is that as a baseline, I've been reading the news and doing the research and, and the fact checking on all of these stories, and it's come to a point where. The right tends to be correct on these things, and the left goes off into Wally World every time. Ukraine Gate being a really great example of the corporate press, the, the establishment Democrats, and the left all lying about what Joe Biden did with respect to Ukraine, when more and more reporting keeps coming up proving he actually did this, even based on the mainstream media's own previous reporting, say from Politico. Politico uh, publishes a story, as does the New York Times, that Ukrainians meddled in the 2016 election in, in an effort to help Democrats. Not that the U- Ukrainian government did, but that elements of you know higher ranking officials uh, in Ukraine did. Uh, a court even ruled this in Ukraine. Joe Biden engages in a quid pro quo where he brags about it on camera. But if you come out and say that, you're called right wing. Mm. They say it's fake news, you're lying, and it's not true. I live in a world based on, do you have sources for that? Just the other night, we got reporting that the person who tried to assassinate the Democrat was a BLM activist. And I said, no, 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 no. 
We are not. That is a rumor. It's not confirmed until we can get official confirmation on the story. Even though there had been, I just hadn't seen it. Because if I don't have the official reporting from a trusted source, it didn't happen. But every single time I go to the news, a good majority of what's considered mainstream corporate press is outright wrong, and they defend it. For example, the crack pipe story. Jen Psaki goes on TV and says, we were never going to give out crack pipes. That's a lie, easily proved by looking at the organizations they were contracting who give crack pipes. I pulled up two different sources, international and national, that say safe smoking kits include meth and crack pipes. Yet when, when the right comes out and says this, Snope says false. All of the corporate establishment press are saying it's not true. There were never any crack pipes. Then Jen Psaki goes on TV and says why did they, no crack pipes. Why, were, why was there an objection to them giving out crack pipes? The right felt it crack would exacerbate, uh, exacerbate crack pipe smoking. Oh, see, in Canada, I remember in the 90s, there, <laughs> crack was, a, is bad. there was a, I remember going to parties and there was a government program to give out um, straws for snorting cocaine wow. because wow. it was because it was being uh, AIDS was right. being communicated was nasally. And so I remember it. I was like, yeah, that's that's the government I like. They give out <laughs> little so, things like, for snorting well, cocaine. Safe needles. But my, listen, so this is what happens. Right? But listen, do you do you honest? Are you honestly telling me that you feel like when you see something on Fox News, you feel like it's probably correct and that it's not and that it's and that it's and that you've never seen a story on no. Fox News that was not was a lot. No, I call out Fox News. It's just I call them out less. Well, frequently. then what are I mean? And Fox News what is are, one what station we, compared the to the problem 70. here. The problem here is the informational networks. It's not the sides. That's what I'm That's trying it, to tell yeah. you. But what ends up happening is after a decade of this, it has become so divergent that you cannot convince an 18 year old who's voting for these policies that the majority of their life was based on lies. So uh, I'll, I'll give you another example of what's caused all this. And I don't know if you looked into this, but um, in the uh, have you looked at the Lexus Nexus data on crit on critical race theory and, and woke terminology? No, I don't. I have not checked that. At the end of two thousand of the two thousands, Lexus Nexus tracks massive spikes in the New York Times saying things like white privilege, sure, yeah. racism, class privilege. Et you don't need Lexus Nexus to tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, several things happened. One. Millennials who were in colleges, who are being, who are learning these things, started to age into the workforce. But the biggest thing that happened was Facebook created the algorithms that prop up content based on how many keywords are in them. So someone who's eight years old, it goes on Facebook, and they start getting inundated with videos of police brutality for ten years. Why? Because it clicks really well. Anger and justice themes do really, really well on Facebook. But so does the opposite, dude. I mean, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, like anger and justice can go either way. Well, like the, I mean, the, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but like, surely we can all see that. Like, I, I've I've definitely not been a friend to wokeness. You can read well, my sure. you but can let, read my writing on let, it. Like, let, I've been punished enough let, for let me, it. Let me but like, you. like just to be clear, like what we're my point here is really this, that the crisis that your country is facing is so severe that that these these debates are increasingly meaningless because they take place in a context of, you know, essentially semantic collapse. Dude, you could I see agree. people in the You're metaverse right. wearing with black avatars and with white avatars. Doesn't matter if they're black or white in real life, but you'll see them segment into their little avatars in the game, but, and they're going to act like real life as if it's real. Let me. Let me. People let me, are wired to be I'll, like I'll, that. I'll make this point real and quick, and we can change that. But semantic so, collapse. I want to hear what you think about. But so so. Uh, it, like yes. I want I want your opinion on that. But let I'm me, curious about that. So the uh, you already mentioned that these new, these media organizations tend to drift left. It's, well, the, there's there's it's, both. Fox definitely has gone way right. It keeps hold, hold, going wait, wait, way wait. right. D Tucker Carlson has become increasingly more populist and supportive of yeah. previous left-wing positions. Now, Hannity, I'm not a big fan of, but hold on. Hold on there a minute. Mike.com is a really great example. And uh, 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 I'll tell you why I think this is happening and, and probably why it is happening. Mike.com, when they first started, they were libertarian. They were pro-Ron Paul. Right. But within a few years, they became completely woke. Why? At Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, what is deemed safe? Wokeness. So uh, I had this conversation with Jack Dorsey, for, for instance. There are certain things you can't say on social media. It almost always favors the left. But you're massively successful and I'm doing the opposite of that. And I'm a centrist. I mean, come on. They, like, like there, are, there are certainly right wing people. Like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is not right wing. Well, no, I wouldn't he's say a, he is he's, either. He's, he's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say is either. But. Well, then maybe like the right has been decimated on social media. 
And so these companies see the algorithm. Certainly favoring. the left would fa say the other thing. But they're, it's when 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 Mike dot com starts off libertarian and then becomes woke. When Vice.com starts off as an edgy bro frat boy kind of punk website and becomes feminist. Well, when Vice ABC is, News Vice funds is, hundreds of millions of dollars and then six months later says, we're going woke, everybody. It is not the going the other direction. It's flowing one way. No, no, no. I mean, it is just flowing always. It's flowing like that. The, the process that's underway is complementary radicalization. But I mean, that that is what it is. It's I'm, like I'm it's that the right becomes more right because the left becomes more left. Have you seen the Pew data on this? Well, yeah, but the Pew data, you know, unequivocally supports right, like the, the radicalization online as being a right wing phenomenon. Except the cast of Pew terrorism shows would be that. That the Republican Party has moved on a scale of zero through 10 with zero being left and 10 being right. They've moved 1.5 degrees to the right since 94 and the left has jumped three points. Yeah, but it depends. It, it depends also if you check the, check the racial resentment numbers, which spike hugely for Republicans. Right. So like they're 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 different. There are a whole bunch of ways of reading those numbers. What are those numbers? Well, the racial racial resentment. Yeah, what's that? So racial resentment is like, uh, well, it's a pretty complicated sociological thing. It's a bunch of different factors, but it's like how you, it, it's not necessarily racism per se. It's whether you feel threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that and, and so that that number like rather than being an ideology, like rather than being a ideology as in I am a racist it is let's, like how you feel about certain aspects of life let, so let's, that and those numbers were identical for Democrats and Republicans in I think 1990 and I'll, then they I, again don't quote me on that but I want to address the semantic yes breakdown. because I would really like you know we're here we're doing this show people are listening to it right now what are we doing to prevent semantic breakdown well, I don't know. I mean, having a conversation that clarifies definitions like Marxism, for instance, is probably helpful. Right. Uh, racism has come to mean completely different things. Well, that's not it's that's essentially a well, I, I don't know that that, you know, I've been doing this for so long that I try to stay extremely precise in all the terms. Like, as you said, I don't like to use terrorism unless it is actually like the technical definition of terrorism. I like to use I, like I part of the book because this stuff is so fraught i i want to be i want to have the terminology exact like what you is civil anymore. war what is civil strife what is so on well i think you can be but um it requires um a certain amount of loss it, it requires a certain amount of loss of force uh, in your argument for sure it does the, the, the yeah, left humility the, man the left and the right uh the right has a traditional view of language like we use words that mean things they meant 20 years ago and the left has redefined things for the most part. Well, the left is involved in a language etiquette that is totally destructive and and, and just is self-consuming, as I said. Like, there is, a, there is a, well, I mean, as Marx said in the German ideology, like, there was a man who thought, uh, if I define river differently, no one will drown. Right. That's yeah. and, and that's what that's what the left has become, where they think, think that definitions I, will they think that definitions will change reality. I have, I have a good example of what I think is uh, contributing to the breakdown and why I think there's no solution. I feel like many on the right are looking for an anchor, like just tell me where we stand and what where we are. And I'll try and figure out what's going on. Whereas the left just says, I will do as the as the tide flows. So the example on this is... But the left eats itself. Well, they, yeah, certainly but, they're a swarm. But that doesn't but, mean they go make, away. Let me finish this point. Sorry. Well, nobody goes away. I mean, me, if me, people went away, it would be easier. The, the point I was going to make is uh, I saw a meme recently where someone was talking about uh, vaccines. And yeah. then someone responded. They, they, they said uh, someone made the meme about seatbelts. They were like, oh, we should ban seatbelt mandates. And someone said... You know, hate to break it to you, but seatbelts aren't intended to prevent an accident. They're prevent to reduce your risk of injury in the event one happens. And then all of the people on the left started laughing, saying, how stupid do you have to be? That's literally what vaccines do. The problem is for people on the right, Joe Biden came out publicly and addressed the nation saying vaccines prevent transmission. And Dr. Fauci and, and they all said something very similar. Now, I understand science changes, but it's very difficult to latch onto something if it goes back and forth. So people well, I mean, we're dealing like the the, the 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 situation with like this is a chaotic moment of of real chaos. But this is like this is not this, that has nothing to do with semantic chaos. No, no, that no, has I'm, to do with the fact of trying to figure things out. Also, suddenly there's Omicron. Suddenly, I mean, the, people are people, people are doing this anything. on the well. You're, that's 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 just you know stuff happens. Like you're you're just trying but, to figure but, out what the hell uh, happened. Uh, the, 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 I am know? not saying you know fault on either side on this. What I'm saying, one of the things that that is causing a divide is 
people have different tolerances for a change in, in information or they have expectations. Mm. That's possible. Although it seems to me like the radicalization is happening, you know, at the same level and, and happening. Uh, and, and don't you feel everyone's out there looking for an anchor? I mean, God knows the people no, I talk no. to on the left are desperate for some kind of stability. I mean, maybe, that, maybe. That, that's the one hope I have is that, you know, the, the, the chaos has become so intolerable to people but, that, but, they, that they need some kind of, they, they really start to crave they need, structure. They're, God, they're scared man. to step through the fire. So uh, again, to throw it back to Jussie Smollett, for instance, Covington kids, big cultural moments that were absolutely wrong. For a lot of people that, you know, we've even had on the show, they've said, this was the moment I said, I just can't live this way anymore and I need something solid. And so I said, I can't trust these people who keep lying to me and I look for something else. I mean, those are very specific moments. Like what's the, what's the technical term for the, the fallacy where you take one example and exclude it to everything else? I mean, you know, everyone has their example. God there's knows a, there's, there's enough. There's a level of tolerance. God, God, there's enough chaos out there. There's enough nonsense. But, uh, you know, why, like, why take Because they never, they never apologized. They never admitted it. See, I think not to be too much of a salesman, mm. like not like I don't like you actually have a lot of information about this that I don't have. But I think what I try to do in my book is go 30,000 feet in the air. I, right? I think, I think your like, book buys a lot of information I don't have in people. Yes, I think it does. Yeah. But to, to go, th like, w I think we need some perspective on this stuff. Like, Jesse Smollett is not a major incident in American history. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's no. a grain of sand I, in a heap. I've, it's oh, a, it, that's a, a, that's a really good way American of putting history. it. But it was a joke. It, 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 but, but it wasn't a joke in the sense the way institutions latched onto it, the way elected officials latched onto it, the media latched onto it. And I think one of the ways where I, I don't want to say I disagree with you, but where yeah. we see the world differently, I do not see the right trying to cancel the left the way the left tries to cancel the right. Small example of that. You have this lovely singer, British chick Adele, who won an award and because of the current time period – a week ago, it was a gender neutral artist of the year. And in her acceptance speech, she said, I wish it weren't, I won't fake a British accent. I wish it weren't, uh, although she's Cockney, I wish it weren't artist of the year. I wish it were woman of the year because I love being a woman. That turned into Adele's trying to cancel the trans movement. Adele should be banned on Spotify. Stop sure. buying Adele. I don't ever see that on the right. And proof of that is two years ago, the NFL, they kneel at the anthem. Stop watching the NFL. No one stopped watching but the NFL. Well, they no one stopped. Burning, they no. Burning, like, <laughs> what would, what Look would at the, the Super Bowl numbers. Look at the playoff numbers. The right can't go what, to a, go to a do, cancel would, culture the way the left can. What would have to happen for people to stop watching the NFL? It's unimaginable. I don't know. <laughs> well, like, exactly. That would, like, the, the Civil War could happen but, or not, but, 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 but the but NFL the, is going to continue. But look at the movement to get Taylor Swift to pull her record off of Spotify because of Joe Rogan. I don't think you see that on the right. There are calls for it. Certainly there are calls for it. We should stop, the, the NFL being the best example, we should stop watching the NFL, but they don't. But see, yeah, the like, right couldn't boycott I, a single, these, these the, cultural the right moments. Couldn't like, boycott Netflix after Cuties came out. I don't, don't see the. Don't think, yeah, like, okay, I don't see the. the like that's you guys are worried. You guys are worried about Jesse Smollett, and you're worried about the NFL, and you're worried about the halftime show. No, no, no. Hold on. What hold I'm on, worried no, no, about. No, no, hold on. Those are grains of sand in the heat. Yes. No, no, no. I, fair enough. I'm worried about commentary. Not, what the left's worried about is that the left's worried about is that by 2040, 50 percent of the country is going to be in. 50 percent of the Senate is going to. Sorry, 85 percent of the Senate is going to be controlled by 50 percent of the country. That's a good thing. But that's, well, I mean, that really, to me, devolves into like pseudo democracy. We're a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Ah, well, see, this is where we get into it's time to separate. Because like, I think there are two visions of America. One is a constitutional republic, a settler republic, and the other is a multicultural democracy. And I think they are fundamentally irreconcilable. I agree. And they, and, and they, and it, they actually, they're actually... You need two countries because like the time has come for uh, like these are both visions that have their merits and they have their demerits. Right. But, you know, certainly I am on the side of multicultural democracy all day, forever. Um, that's where I come. You from. mean like 51 so, percent decides the law? Uh, yeah. With minority protections. Yeah. What's like, a minority like what, protection? Yeah, what's it? Well, those are by law. So those are not, well, I mean, if you actually want to know what I believe, it's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of the Canadian Constitution, which is incredibly specific and was written in 1982 and contains all of this beautifully articulated in a, uh, in well, a simple way. But, but my, my point really here is like, 
like whichever side you're on of this, these two countries can't coexist. Like it has to be one or the other. And it really can't be both. I'd like to see people democratically choosing where their tax dollars go, well, but right, also right, having some sort of republicanism. That's a good, well, I'm that's done. A good point. Oh, that's, that's that would be I mean, an idea of an amalgam. Uh, uh, well, that, that, America I, has been an amalgam. America's a massive contradiction. And, you know, the beauty of America, its great gift is has been its capacity to hold contradictory ideas at the same time. Um, like that is that is the glory of America. And, and that's because what, it's a constitutional republic, it's able to. Well, I think actually it's when you go back to the original constitution, it contains a whole coast of political ideas that are in conflict. And also, you know, it, it believes in it believes in in struggle as it believes in disagreement. I mean, that's the that's the amazing gift of the American Constitution is that it believes that you don't need unity. You need disagreement to get to the best answer right but that that only works if you have a concept of yourself as a unified whole and and when that evaporates when that dissolves you're left with you know irreconcilability and that like i think you know have you read washington's farewell address recently i mean it's really worth reading because it's a great work of genius like it is it's a really fascinating book because he work because he predicts exactly where you are right now like exactly where you are right now. And he did it, you know, on his retirement. I imagine you did a lot of research on the first American Civil War. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much work on it. Like, I for would sure. never call myself an expert no, on that. Sure. Like, I definitely read a lot of books about just, it. But just, you know, I'm not, I would never. There are some things in here that I do consider myself an expert on. But mm. that there are so many Civil War experts. Just because so, um, you, asked, you asked me earlier what I thought was going to happen. We didn't quite get into it. Yeah. I will say we spent a lot of time, um, you know, you from 30,000 feet me from someone on the ground trying to explain my positions. I don't think I need to explain them to you right. for the most part. I think, you know, you wrote a book. I obviously want to explain it to the audience. But um, as for what I think is going to happen, we hear a lot of peaceful divorce. You mentioned these two countries can't exist. But there is, in my opinion, no scenario in which there's a peaceful divorce. It's almost impossible. And the, uh, the reason for it is it was actually someone on the show brought this up. I can't remember who, but they made a great point. Uh, there's two countries. You can say multicultural democracy and constitutional republic. Both have their merits. The first civil war, what happened? It was like, I think four states legally seceded. Yeah. Everybody was like, all right. Then uh, I think seven more states joined in and they all went, well, okay then. And then the North said, but these military bases are ours and we are going to remain in them. And that's when Fort Sumter in South Carolina, they said, no, 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 no. Hold on. You got to leave. Nobody believed the muskets were loaded. Nobody believed the cannons were were armed. They all thought that it was just bluster and there would be no fighting because it could never happen here. That's right. And then the bombardment started. No one foresaw the first civil war. Yes. Like no like even though in hindsight it all seems perfectly clear and the structures are all there and it's like there's no way that it couldn't be a civil war after the nullification crisis and the mum the the, the uh, uh, bloody Kansas session. after whatever happened here. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, Harper's Ferry, Harper's Ferry. Like mm-hmm. we're like 15 kilometers away from where this happened. But like, you know, after all that, but even Fort Sumner, I mean, Jefferson Davis said it's probably nothing. Yep. I right. bet the, the leaders of the North knew there was something coming. As well, soon as they left, to, they're like, yo, we're getting that back. They had to go to Europe to buy guns. Yeah. The North, and the, the industrial the superpower of the world. In 1850. Wow. Had to go to Europe. I wonder how much of our treasury they sold to, out for those weapons. They bought a lot of guns. Right? And so here's what here's what happens now. It, uh, uh, so it'll bankrupt there was, there was the country a great too. Great. Um, I think Texas had written this, that they had joined the South simply by nature of geography. Yes. Not ideology. Same thing would happen today because. Well, they were, Texas was a slave state. California was sure. a free state, and that's what that's where they lined up. But they were so nascent. I mean, you're talking they, about you know, you're not talking about large groups of people, right? 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 In the, the, in the, the first the, civil the, war, the idea was, uh, and then you also had slave states who joined the north by by nature, yeah, of geography, yeah, because of geography, yeah. So what what I think would happen, but there was now, only one, right? Maryland, I think. I think it was, was. I think West Virginia too. West Virginia was not a slave state. West Virginia seceded right. from Virginia. Virginia, right? Okay. So. What would happen today is you would likely have New York, Illinois, California, maybe Washington, maybe yeah. Oregon. You you write all that stuff. I imagine. I'm going to show you the map that I got. I want to oh, know. Nice. I know. I know. I want to know what you, whether you think it's uh, reasonable. But go on, please. Please keep it. So, so I think it could start with uh, rapid defederalization, but then ultimately, what will end up happening is one side's going to say, "Yeah, I'll slide that over." One side's what? Which, what's the page number? Two two eighteen. 218. One side's going to say, let me grab this book. 
Excuse me. Hey, those 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 nukes, those weapons, those resources are ours and we want them. The other side's going to say, sorry, no dice. Fighting starts. Well, the problem is like to negotiate a settlement, you need goodwill. Right. There are countries that negotiate separation like Czechoslovakia, where they do negotiate in, 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 in goodwill. And that's what happened with Norway and Sweden. Yeah. Tell me what you think of that. I mean, that, so, that is not a. I wonder what the best way to show this is actually. Cause sure. I, don't, I wonder if like, is there any, so. I can't zoom in can't on really you. See it. Well, but, it's basically the north, northeast and then the south and midwest and then California to Oregon you, and then Texas. Have you seen the poll? I think it was YouGov data showing the different five different regions of the U.S. You've got the Midwest, the yeah. South. And they were all basically saying, yeah, let's you, break off. You know what you will really like in that book is the psychometric data, which is like different personality types by region, which is actually fascinating and like goes to really deep seated structural differences between the between these groups. But that the one that I had only had three. I like how uh, Texas is just goes back to Texas. Well, Texas, like they right. have a, they have a very active nationalist movement that's yeah. quite together. And like and also Texas would 100 percent work as a country. Right. I, 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 uh, what do you think? You think it's close? Yeah, I think you're close. The yeah. only issue is I think it ends up with uh, a bunch of war. Well, the, the problem is that, like, first of all, to negotiate a settlement, you need goodwill. And then the, the UN, to negotiate with the UN, which I know sounds ridiculous, but you know, you can't, no one will land in an airport until you have UN agreement that you're a separate country, is really, really hard, especially with a country that has security, uh, general, what's it called, security council. Uh, placement so like it, it it would be incredibly difficult let me let me ask you to negotiate a secession have you researched abortion well no that's 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 polarization that's part of polarization of course i did just write about it something about it in lit hub about uh, about the politics of abortion as a factor in um in polarization i mean you know the most bizarre thing about it is that uh, you know the the when you, this is again looking at it from a foreign country is like abortion in the United States should be one of the policies that everyone agrees on. Like it is a success story. Like w women get more control over their reproductive health every year. A abortion rates have declined nineteen percent between twenty eleven and twenty seventeen. Like if you want to end abortion in America, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Like it's not like it, it is a it's a policy success. No one can see it. Yeah. Everyone is screaming at each other. No one, like, everyone, so one side is screaming life. The other one is screaming choice. They, if you were to ask yourself what the correct policy is, you would see that the policy is both, like, women get control over their reproductive health. That's what leads to declines in abortion rates. And it, it, so it's a win-win for everyone. But because it's so divided, they can't, they can't see those basic facts. But well, so that's, that, that doesn't, that's not really a contributing factor to what I'm talking I, about in the book. The, the, the reason I bring it up is I think it could be a uh, strong moral issue in this civil war. Notably, oh, it's huge. It's a huge thing. But there are a whole bunch of them. Church attendance, corporal punishment in schools. Uh, like there's the sociological factors that go into it are actually really significant. So uh, are you familiar that the, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments on Roe v. Wade? Yeah. Uh, well, not on Roe v. Wade, on Mississippi. On Mississippi, F yeah. Florida just, uh, they just uh, passed a, a ban after 15 weeks. Right. And so, uh, man, we, we've had a bunch of people in here. We've had legal experts and everyone seems to agree that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. It's going to cause so much anger. There's already 12 states that have trigger laws. As soon as Roe v. Wade is overturned, right. instantly done, banned. Yeah. So my question is, you mentioned the far right. This is what I've said. Do you think that when that happens, yeah. do you think Republicans will try to ban abortion nationally? Oh, I have no idea. Like, that's not, I don't have expertise in that. Like, I, I'm sorry, but like, I just can't really give a, a, an honest or accurate answer to that question. I mean, I would say that once that happens, that... That like one thing that is that it's that I notice in this book is like the right has said concept of civil war for a long time, right? Like for at least since the 90s. And it was a fringe position, but it, it sort of became more mainstream in 2008. But I think the left is actually starting to catch up, right? The left is actually starting to catch up to the idea that like this country isn't working. Its institutions are failing. There's going to have to be a response to this. And I, I think abortion could be a major trigger of it. Like, I think there are a lot of people who don't, who, you know, you asked me that question, like, what if healthcare 
was taken away. Way taken yeah. away from me. Like th- it, it will be like that for them. So I, I there's, there's, there's a lot to this. For one, many uh, conservatives have told me no Republicans will never try to ban it federally. Not only that, they can't. It's not a federal. Uh, it's not. It can't be federally federally legislated. It has to be at the at, at the state, state level. level. Yeah. But um, my question is, do you think there's any number of right wing people, any small number, who would be willing to go to an abortion clinic the moment Roe v. Wade is overturned? And say with force, end what you're doing right now. Well, you know, the criminalization of abortion is one of the worst policy ideas it's possible to have because you have to ask yourself all kinds of questions. Like, are well, you going to start? Are you going to start a well, DEA for abortion? Sure, sure. Like, sure. It's, it's, it's not an argument. But my about point is, the like, they're not really thinking about policy. No, no, for sure. But do you like, think? Do like, you think people would be like? Do you think there would be a John Brown of abortion? Who's going to walk up to an abortion doctor and just blow his brains out? But it's already happened. Well, exactly. I like, mean, a, like a lot. Like it's happened many, many times. Like right, there's, right, right. there's been a huge amount of violence around that. So it's kind of a, the question I'm getting. Well, to that's is, see, like when we're talking about the numbers of what constitutes political violence, that doesn't co- qualify as political violence in in the in the stats that we looked at, going up and killing an abortion doctor. But I, I of course would qualify it as that, right? So like, yeah, like a- absolutely, I think. Um, so, so just, but it's, the, the point is not really the violent extremists. The point is, do they start a police force? Do, like, how are they going to actually manage? The, like, you know, the Texas law well, so the, was not policy. My, it was just like, we're going to start this crazy bounty system that got, I mean, no one knows what the hell that would look like. They don't want to actually answer the question of what the what the police regulation of this would look like, especially given the fact that, you know, well, America think, can't even control the flow of heroin. I think it's, onto its I, think streets. It's, I think it's simple. I think these red States are going to, they're going to shut down all of their Planned Parenthoods and, and yeah. And, they, and they've gone a long way already. I mean, when you look right. at proximity to abortion access in America, like red and blue States, I mean, just the world of difference. So right. you either get to a point where, you know, uh, California immigrant sanctuary state, they're already defying federal law. Then you've got, Yes, they certainly did in 2016. I mean, Jeff Sessions, that's a big chapter in the book. But I'll tell you what else. I mean, New York voting for non-citizens to have the right to vote. Massachusetts voting for non-citizens to get driver's licenses. This is my point. Like, I think the left is starting to figure out, like, that would have been, those kind of defiant actions would have been typical of uh, red states for its whole history. But I think now, oh, sorry, I've got it mixed up. Blue states. You know, everywhere else in the world, red means left. And yeah. Blue you know why that changed, right? Yeah, it was it was 2000 election, right? As I someone think so. ex- someone explained it? it to me. Yeah, yeah. but it um, used to be the other way around. It used to be the other way around. Yeah, um, but so y- now people on the left are figuring out we're going to be in defiance of federal authority. So uh, uh, well, so uh, we've had sanctuary cities on the left for a long yeah. time. We've had now California sanctuary state. Do you, you know how our elections work in this country? The electoral college. I've tried. Well, yeah. I mean. I try like as a, as I almost put a chapter in the book about it, but I could not find <laughs> unbiased opinion. Like well, that was the thing that was so amazing. It's like I can't find anyone well, no, no, who no, can explain it to me in a coherent the, way. The, the electoral college. Well, the electoral college. Yeah, I understand that. So, uh, in the United States, non-citizens do have voting power in every single election. So when California says we are going to allow non-citizens into this country and provide them benefits, they are seizing federal authority. What, the way it works is uh, the census. They're, I'm sorry, seizing. Oh, okay, I seizing see. Seizing federal you mean. power. Yeah, okay, they're, gotcha. They're, they're stealing disproportionate amounts of power within our federal. Well, I would say they're system. in defiance of. Federal no, 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 no. They're actually stealing. Okay, all right. So here's how it works. Um, the electoral college is based on congressional seats. You get an electoral uh, yeah. elector vote, and your seats in in Congress are based upon your population size, not citizen size. Right. So when California allows in non citizens. The census is done, non-citizens are counted, and they get extra congressional representation, which then results in, it, it results in disproportionate voting power, and it results in disproportionate power to, to elect the president. I think, according to the Heritage Foundation, California in the last election only got one additional electoral vote. But when we're talking about, you know, what is it, 538? I mean, that's substantive. Mm. That, 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 that's a decent amount of, of gained power. And it's not just California, it's other sanctuary cities and states. So the left likes to come out and say, it's unfair that the Senate is comprised of, you know, X amount of senators who, com- who come from only a certain amount of states when they're engaging in defiance of federal authority to give themselves disproportionate votes in, in Congress and the Electoral College. But, I mean, it's really kind of much of a muchness because the, the, the problem here is, like, I think you're going to have an election relatively soon. Like, not, I don't know if it's 2024, I don't think, I don't know if it's 2028, might even be 2032 if you're lucky, 
where you're going to have a president lose the popular mandate by 10 million votes and still win the election. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, that's, I mean, I, the, the, whether it's that's the way it's supposed to be or not, you're going to have a huge number of people in your country who don't regard themselves as living in a legitimate democracy. And so but when not you a democracy. Ha- Right. Never have been. Okay. Well, so, I, so I mean, you did issue. call yourself the world's greatest democracy for a long time. Yeah. And, but, until, and in 2000, you said we're going to export democracy to the world. But this is, this and, is, this uh, is, you know, this you is have been, media establishment politicians who have no idea what they're talking well, about. Well, you know, you did call yourself a democracy for 240 years. I mean, who, like. Who did? Well, like Ronald Reagan. Like, I mean, like every, every American president I ever for heard sure. called yourself a democracy. And, and so if you're saying you're not a democracy. Problem. And, and, and this is part of the problem. So uh, th- there's a reason we have an electoral college. There's a famous quote from Benjamin Franklin. Democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding what's for lunch. A republic is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. I'll give you, I'll give you that's a- not that's that's minoritarian, but that's not the same thing. as That's minority protection. That's not the same thing well, as then. minoritarian rule. I mean, that is that is a very big the distinction. I-, I mean, in Canada, we understand this really implicitly. Right. Like we have a minority population, French Canadians, who are, you know, who, who have to be protected from the majority rule by like just to keep the country together. Good and, call. And we also. Right? So that's like a also, very distinct. That's a distinct and, thing. And we also have the system because there was a period where California was much like Wyoming with no electoral yes. power. The fact that people choose to live in, in populous states, you actually need a functional control for that. So people don't all just crowd into one tight space and they actually spread out. And that is the system. But that's the place. opposite of where we're going in this world. I mean, other than you who moved from. No, no, no. It's actually, a, it's a we're, rural, we're, rural. we're actually seeing people leave cities because of the problems. Yeah, well, and and well, it's probably also COVID. From Wikipedia, it looks like we are officially a federal presidential constitutional republic. Yes. So let me let me give <laughs> oh, an Wikipedia. example of. Uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned minority protections is a good thing. The, the example that I experienced. But minority protection is different from minoritarian rule. No, no, I love sure. that. That's important. So in, in, in California, when I was covering the drought. We went to yes, uh, fascinating. East Porterville, a small, mostly migrant city with no water. Why? The the farmers were for were not allowed to access access to surface water because of the drought. The surface water had be had to be rerouted to cities. Why? Because the cities had voting power and voted away the water from the people who actually had it. So what happens is the farmers, being a large portion of the United States' economy, yeah. said we're going to have to drill deeper and deeper into groundwater, and they went down thousands, even tens of thousands of feet. The small, the small family migrant workers could only d- drill about 30 feet and their water went dry. That's chapter three. Big cities, inequality, et cetera. Well, it's not that so much as the water problem that the United States faces. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that, was the, that was the chapter that kept me up at night. Dude, it's did, funny, did, not, did, any did, of the, did, not, not any of the politics stuff. Like, it's funny. The one that kept me up was talking to like a, an expert at the USDA on corn. Did you did you uh, look into the the lawsuit attempts to seize Great Lakes water? Yeah, and stuff like that? well, That's well, crazy. of course, in Canada, we're really obsessed with this because like we have all the water, right? Like we have one fifth of the world's natural water supply, and so what happens when you guys run out of your water is of great concern to us. So there was there was a, an attempt by I could be getting this wrong. It's been a while. Arizona, I think, was filing a federal suit, right, claiming they had access to yeah. the Great Lakes. But the problem for them was. The Great Lakes Coalition includes Canada. Yes. So I think specifically Ontario. And yeah, is well, Ontario? and Manitoba as well. And Manitoba. Yeah. And so basically they were like, we have an international treaty on this water. You can't touch that's it. That's right. And that's really important to us. Is it important to, <laughs> like, well, I'm from Chicago. Right. I mean, the, yeah. The, the thing about uh, Lake Michigan, for instance, is that we were depleting it because so much water was being consumed. We had to put in environmental protections to make sure the water replenished before, so we, we could only take so much from well, it. Well, I mean, the worst thing to me is the Ogallala Aquifer which they're accessing to grow. Like we live in an era of completely cheap food, like artificially cheap food, largely driven by Midwest, the genius of Midwestern farmers who have innovated corn to a point of, you know, extreme productivity. And that's driven by this aquifer that is not renewable. Yeah, right? like that's just water they're taking out of the ground that when it's gone, it's gone. Wow. And when, where they go from there, they don't really know. And like, Im- I want you to imagine a world where we don't have cheap food anymore. That's, a, that's it, it added to all this stuff we're talking about, right? Added to all this, all this conflict. Like that, that's when things start to get real in a hurry. I, uh, uh, I tweeted this a while ago. In 50 years, we are going to look back and laugh about literally flushing fresh water down the toilet. 
Well, I mean, you already have it in certain places. Like, you know, when, when, in, when California goes through its droughts, right? Like, you know, people brush their teeth very carefully, right? Like they, you know, like it's not like, you know, you know. You know some people do. Some people do, yeah. some people don't. I think course. most people don't. I was encouraging people to pee in the sink for a while. <laughs> Um, do it. No, Don't waste no, that water for a frat boy solution. Ian, to, you pee uh, in the top of the toilet. I roll a 20. Roll initiative. You, 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 no, you pee in the top of the toilet the so you can toilet. flush with urine. Oh, all right. that's, you're that's always the thinking. way. News hey, you can use. That's, that's, the hippie, that's, that's, that's useful Steve, stuff. Steve, <laughs> did you ever like um, in any of these like when you were like stinging of all the potential possibilities, did, yeah. did you ever find out like corporations would get involved and be like, hey, we're going to supply your weapons and help you win when, and you give us states when you win, we'll take Florida on. No, I mean, that was not something I looked at. I mean, what I looked at was inequality levels, which are, of course, like catastrophically high. And, uh, you know, they there are no examples of history of countries with inequality rates like the United States that don't end in war revolution or mass death like it's yep. like it's a like it's a there like you go like you're literally like i have a lot of like on the one hand this on the one hand this in the book right like uh, some examples go this way some examples go the other way but when you look at inequality levels like the ones you have in the united states they only go one way and this is financial inequality well um it, it's it's Income inequality is the main one, but the one is it's also the wealth inequality, the wealth gap, which is catastrophic. Yeah, capital's uh, and, and an the, interesting And this, these past couple of years, it's oh, it's just so exploded. Mm-hmm. People, well, and it, it tend, like it builds on itself, right? I mean, that's the thing about capital; it builds on itself. Part, right? It might be a problem is that you give money to your kids. I like it. I mean, it's always been normal, but like it's making stupid rich people, like kids that aren't qualified for the money, are growing up with it and well, have this power. Well, as I say, like I, I, I try not to judge anyone. Like I'm not, like yeah, I'm, it's not I'm, every time. I'm looking at structures here, but what I do know is that when you get to inequality levels with this kind of structural problem, it just creates huge amounts so of turbulence. Obviously, you've pointed out problems. Have you thought of any solutions? Well, I mean, much like Tim here, <laughs> like I'm not sure. I see. Uh, I mean, so don't judge the, me. The, well, I'm not. I, no, like, I'm kidding. The, I think what I, I think. Bro. I think my strength in this book is that I'm not on either side of this. So I don't really, I disagree. Well, I want stability. I think, I I think you are on the, the, the the left side. Well, I guess maybe, but you know, I would say that I kind of tried to consciously work against that. Like, obviously I'm a Canadian. I believe in socialized medicine and gun control, but the conservative party believes in that. Right. Like, like, so it's, I, I definitely don't feel affiliated with the democratic tribe. Right. Like, and I don't, and I don't feel like, like when you mentioned Biden, like I have you know, he means nothing to me. Like but the truckers. Oh, uh, you want to do the truckers now, eh? Oh, sure. You know, I don't know. I'm, well, I, 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 you I mean, finally got your first A in. Thank you. It's been all <laughs> evening. Did I say A? Yes, you did. I didn't even know. Finally. <laughs> uh, I was the, waiting the, for it. Yeah. Uh, well, I actually say it a lot. Nice. So, so the, the, just, just to start this off. Yeah. Um, the same people who supported occupational protests with Occupy Wall Street and the, Occup- and the, and the Chaz. Yeah. And, and, and the, um, See, I would never Floyd. support any of those, and no, Canada wouldn't sure. support any of those. But um, in America, these yeah. same people are now in, at odds and in defiance well, of these people. if I can be honest with you, like, when I hear the debate here about the trucker convoy, it is, it's like, have you ever seen, like, a movie where you know what really happened? And, like, you see the movie and you're like, it has nothing to do with, like, it's just so distorted that it has nothing to do with reality. Like, that, when I, the the largest support for the trucker convoy I've seen in my life was driving here in Maryland and someone had a big sign up, right? I mean, you have to remember, like, here it's become, like, all this stuff about Trudeau and, you know, all this, like, the person who did the, the original Emergencies Act was Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, yeah. who's a populist conservative, and I, I personally have called him a tin pot Northern Trump in the pages of the New York Times. He would like this is this is a very the political context of this in Canada is just completely separate from the political context here. Like it's it's just it, it's just a completely different framework of interpretation of events, and you know I well, we get we get our news about it from Canadians. Well. They're coming to talk to you, right? No, and no, no, no. Like and we watch, we watch people on the ground who are reporting there on the ground, talking with, interviewing people. Well, yes, but they're sending the sites to American news sources. Like if you look at the no, Globe, no, 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 if you look like, at the like, American, if you look at the Viva, Globe and Mail, Viva Fry is a is a Canadian lawyer yes. who's live streaming it. Right. So I just turn on his stream and we we just watch what he's talking about. Right. Um, he's not the only source we use. 
So for the most I, part, I would just say the reporting that I've seen in American sources from both sides, like it, it has really like I was trying to I was trying to think like how could I explain this and I was like well you know the Quebec premier, who, is a conservative, like he's 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 definitely the right. Um, a month ago, proposed a tax on the unvaccinated, right? Like just a straight yeah. tax. This is a different world than the world you guys are in. You know what I mean? Like, like because of universal health care. Well, we have we have that too, though. Like, you know, like uh, DC had a vax mandate. You couldn't go inside buildings. A tax? Did any American politician suggest? You know what? If you don't get a vaccine, you're going to have to pay a levy. No, they well, gave people free money. Yeah, 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 but, but, get but, but, but like, I, I think it's not even it's, get it. Just like, we're going to we're going to like a, 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 I want you to imagine an American conservative politician saying we're going to tax no, no, people no, for, for sure. not getting vaccinated. What we saw was um, I got to put this back up here. For oh, the, yeah, for, uh, sure. for the ad, what, what we had were the part that uh, everyone's actually going to listen to big, <laughs> big organizations, um, hospitals and uh, corporations saying if you don't get vaccinated, we're deducting we're, we're slashing your pay. But see, you're firing you. Yeah, yeah, or firing you. Universal yeah. health care just completely changes the dynamic of all of these questions, right? And that's why, like, Canadian anger at the truckers is so profound and so w wide. Like, you know, why 70% of Canadians want to call in the military, right? And, like, 70% like, and these are people with kids, right? Like, and, you know, like, 90% of Canadians want them gone, right? Like, the, the reason for that is, like, when you're in a universal healthcare system, uh, they're, when they get sick, it costs me money. It's a burden on the taxpayer, right? And like when they get sick, it takes a space. Like my cousin Cam, who's got problems with his heart and needs surgery, like when they're sick, they, when they're filling I've, up the hospitals, he can't get the treatment that he needs. I have a question. Did, yeah. they, did they distribute vaccines on the basis of race in Canada? Uh, yeah, well, there was a they went to indigenous populations first because they were uh, they were more vulnerable to the disease. So they, they did go. But those are, you know, very those are remote communities. I had a friend like who, that's an affront to. No, the, I don't think so. No, for our values. Right. Like, no, but they, they're, they're more they're more vulnerable. Like th those are those they it went to vulnerable that's, communities that's, first. That's, that's very racist. Experimenting on no no the no. Most it's vulnerable. like it's, yeah, no no no. Quite literally, in the United States, to claim that a certain person of a certain race is, has certain different susceptibilities or different traits based on race is overtly racist. I think racist. sickle cell anemia was endemic to the African American population. That's racist. Well, in in America, well, it's smaller, I, I, I guess. I, I mean. So, so it's I don't it's like those. That's the why well, wouldn't I wouldn't say it is contradictory. No, no in the United States, it is. Yeah. Well, th what I'm saying is that the. The Canadian f facts on the ground are just totally separate. No, for sure. From for the sure. from the debate that you guys but are the, having, the debate you guys are, and and I mean, lar like another thing is like you know, less than thirty percent of the fundraising for this group came from Canadian sources. I actually uh, read that wasn't true. Well, there's different. It really depends on how you read the numbers, but it's it's definitely the majority of the funding came from American sources. The only the only source I've actually but that's the seen give on send it. go. That's no, that's no, the give send go. The only source I've seen on are that the majority was actually Canadian sources. No, I've 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 completely different sources. I mean, you know, and there like, lies one of the it's big a six, problems. It's a nine. Exactly. Yeah, you guys are both. Who knows? It's the same. Yeah. Shape, well, but. I mean, I I well, I, I certainly uh, well, you can look it up. Well, the pro you know what the problem is there's no way to look it up. If if I, I know, isn't that the truth? If, if I type in Canadians funded truckers, I know. Well, I'll find all the sources. Yeah, everything. If I type in Americans did it, I'll find all the sources. Yeah, yeah, I know. So That's I'm true. like, I don't even know what to search for. But like, I would just say like, it's when I see the American debate around it, like I've, ne I've yet to see an, um, an American left wing source say that the number one enemy of the truckers is Rob Ford's brother. Right. Like the, the like, left wing source. Like, yeah, like MSNBC, it's become this debate around Justin Trudeau or whatever. But oh, like, right, right. but like the point <laughs> is like the conservatives have all said, go home. The like the, the 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 like he is the most conservative. He's also the most powerful conservative in Canada. If I were gambling, I would say he'd be our next conservative prime minister. Um, like he and he, I think it, I think this might make him the next conservative prime minister. Uh, like he he's very active in this, right? So no one no one seems capable of mentioning that. I'll, I'll tell you. You know what? I got a prediction. Here's yeah. what's going to happen. When the civil war breaks out in the United States, we annex Canada. First thing. I want to do a TV show about it. <laughs> I really, I've honestly had, I've, I've, a, I, cause I've be asked myself show. the question, what would an, how would an occupied Canada act? 
How would, have you like, ever, would they, would they, would we resist? Because, you know, like we're talking here, like if I were to tell you I was an American, you would believe me. Right. I, I, I would. I w- yeah. We, we, we would believe you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, like, so it would create, what kind of occupation would it oh, be? Let me, let me tell you. I'll tell you exactly. Do you what, have ideas how it goes? I know exactly how <laughs> it'll happen. So imagine now it's one year after the occupation. Um, all the Canadians are dancing in the street in their cars, throwing money in the air. They all got gold chains. Everyone <laughs> owns a Lamborghini. They're all yes. rich and successful. And they're like, man, this freedom stuff worked out way better than our crappy government. <laughs> Everyone's but, drinking you know, water. I, that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, like, I, I think do, America and U.S. should get together. Well, here's the thing. What I, what I really wonder about it is what if they, Canada, if they made every right. province a state— so that would be, let's say, ten provinces a state. That would make the America way left wing. Well, wasn't there like a, suddenly, suddenly overnight, America would be a left wing. Wasn't there a belief <laughs> back, in, back country in the, that would you yeah. know like over like it would be really wasn't like, there a belief back in the eighties or nineties when Quebec was doing its like stronger separatist movement that yeah. Northwest Territories would try to apply for American statehood, giving us a direct road to well, Canada. I, there was Alberta. Was a, there, I, yeah. you know, it had the oil. There was well, the, I mean, there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of crazy thinking out there. But you, you know, so the you water, almost had your civil war. I mean, so there's martial law declared in my country now. Like if the government wants to seize my bank accounts, they don't need a court order. That's crazy, right? Like, like still, no. Sure like, oh, did this. oh, 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 this month. Oh, right now, that's so, what you meant from the Quebec yeah, separatist movement. In 1970, yeah. when they had when they declared martial law, they arrested people. You didn't need a warrant to arrest anyone. Yeah. The, my country's nearly died twice in my lifetime: 1982 and 1995. This is not a book of judgment. Hmm. This is a book of like, uh, what's amazing to me, what's the most shocking thing, maybe one of the most shocking things that's happened in my life is that somehow Canada has become the stable country and America has become the unstable country. I mean, if you told me that that would happen when I was 20, yeah, I, I, everyone would have laughed in your face. I, I think it's, uh, in all seriousness, I do think Canada gets involved in whatever civil war happens in the United States. Oh, we're, we're I mean, we're in trouble. Like you're well, this the trucker convoy is already your political proxy. It's a political proxy conflict yep. on our soil of your toxic d- discourse. It feels uh, I, right. I, I, it's, I don't think it's our toxic discourse. I think it, it's 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 the UK has been experiencing this. Canada has been experiencing it. The US, but Canada it is Canada has resisted it in a lot of ways because of because of a bunch of really odd policies. Like we have very strict immigration, but we are very pro immigration. And we have, we have, uh, we didn't, 2008 didn't happen to us, right? Like we didn't, we didn't have Occupy Wall Street because we are, because we're so vulnerable, we, because we're not America, what? like we, we had to protect our banks and our banks came through very safe. Well, the, America is the tip of the spear. It's about, the, uh, it's the yeah. center of the empire. Exactly. What the, I think we're, we're, Mon- we're, Montreal says are the most uh, culturally diverse city in the- Toronto is. Toronto, Toronto. Toronto is more than half foreign born. It's, except, a, it's an open except, city. Except I'm pretty sure Toronto is majority white. Um... No, I mean, the thing that's funny is like Canada has multicultural policy, even though we're about set. Well, I'm sure Toronto is multi is, is majority white. It's just half foreign born. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, Toronto, you know, Canada is about 78 percent white. And yeah. whereas the United States is 58 percent. So it's you know, there's there's a there's quite a gap there, too. Forty seven point nine is the plurality. The plurality is is white. Um, the plurality, so it is not a majority white city. That's interesting. It is not majority white. Interesting. Yeah, just, well, just, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very different policies over in Canada compared. Well, to... Well, we're bringing in four hundred thousand immigrants next year, right? And that's in a country of forty million. Well, we are very, the in Canada, the more patriotic you are, the more in favor of immigration you are. I think that's a, a that's a huge difference, and huge. I think you you were talking about abortion and how you think it's a polarizing issue, and it is. I think. Should the civil war come, those who are not here legally should be the one who are most concerned. Because there are parts of this country that they will ask for your papers, yep. and you will flee to California or Illinois or yep. New York. Well, well already I, I, in 2016, they, there was a flood of people across the border. You know yeah. how many in a civil war people would flood the borders that aren't natural, that would fight? For a side to get their citizenship, yeah. like you'd have hmm. millions no, and millions no, 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 of no, no. foreign. Oh, people. like my great great grandfather, who was Irish, who fought for the North because he wanted except, to be an American. Except Ian, in New York now, you can vote as a non-citizen, so they're going to just go to the state and be like, "We're here anyway," yeah. and then that's it. So, I, you know, that point I made about taxes and geography before. I think one thing you might end up seeing the map you have in your book, yeah, might actually be an accurate starting point. 
Yeah, I mean it's it's very but much states like states will align based on yeah. Geography. I mean it's like a that's that's like a, you know a bar room suggestion. Like obviously it's not it's not like how it would actually, actually I think uh, interestingly, I would I'd be willing to bet New Hampshire at this point would declare independence in any conflict. Well, that's another possibility because like the, they're familiar with the free staters right yeah well there and well and also vermont there's a huge separatist movement in vermont yeah. that's very serious and well i mean they're not as serious as texas but they'll get but, occupied very quickly you know do people want to occupy countries anymore no <laughs> like what what would be the value in occupying new hampshire like that's access the, to what? To maple to, syrup? To the other states as a, that are part of your union. I, I guess. I mean, military the, transport. I, I don't really go there. Like, you know, like the, 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 I would assume that what would happen is that there'd be um, the attempt to control. Like, it would be the, the, the civil war that I envision would not be really between sides, it would be between the forces of order and chaos. People would try. Right. It would be between tr- people who want disorder and want breakdown and people who are trying to keep the institutions alive by by force and like and of course the problem is as america has learned in its counterinsurgency strategy and as you know i talked to uh, an anonymous colonel who was responsible for drawing up what they call full spectrum operations in the homeland like the more you try to control a population militarily that just spreads violence you right? know what, you know what I, th- I think you're right about that point about ordering chaos but yeah. my vision of it is the Democratic establishment, the which used to be the Democrat Republican like uniparty until Donald Trump came in, then you ended up with these neocons joining the Democrats like Bill Kristol, the Lincoln Project people. The Democrats saw these far left individuals, these progressives, as a way to bolster their ranks and get votes. Essentially, the one ring. They thought they could wield the power, but they can't because the woke, the cancel culture stuff, the the far left. They are a chaotic and destructive force. But the, it's also that the institutions themselves are rotting from the center, yeah. mm. right? Like well, it's, not, I mean. it's like, not just a question of like the partisanship. It's a question of like, is the Senate a functional body? No, no, <laughs> right? Like it isn't. Like it's not. It's not a functioning we, body. You, you should. You, you should. Like check you're out. in. You're in a government where supposedly has control of all three levels of like. How, and they can't pass basic policies. Mm. Like well, people don't. No one agrees on on them. Well, exactly, and they know, can't do, whip. Do you know, like they can't, like in 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 Canadian parliament, British parliamentary system, when you control the system, you make the decisions, and then you were responsible for them. Do you know how it used to uh, work our, this way? Here. Do you know yeah. how Congress works? <laughs> so we had uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene on, yeah. and she said, when she went to Congress, she was confused because she's sitting there, and there's like ten Democrats or like five Democrats and like five Republicans, and there's some random guy she doesn't know at the speaker's podium pulls up a bill and goes. Bill, assembly bill, you know, or, or, you know, congressional bill 473 in favor, Democrats. And they go, meh, Republicans, meh, Democrats have it, next bill. And she was like, wait, no one's even voting on this stuff? Right. So she called a roll call vote, which forced all of the members of Congress back to they, actually record their votes. They must have hated her. They, and they, they come after her for it. Yeah. And that's probably why you hear these insane stories about her in the press, because she's in defiance of none of these people want to work. So we had Thomas well, Massey on. Well, you know what their job is. I mean, you know, fundraise. Their, their job right. is fundraising. Exactly. I mean, when you actually talk to, I've, I've been interviewing a politician lately about the inner workings of uh, electoral politics for a possible sequel to this book, and you know, it's staggering. Like, it, like when I, I had like a twenty-minute conversation with this guy, and I was like, oh, well, no wonder this system is so screwed up. Like all, all they think, all they can think about all day is the three levels of fundraising: mm. dark money, social media money, and bundled money that's that's what that's what they do all day that's a big yeah. problem it is a it is it is non-functional like We're, it is non-functioning system Term i agree limits. and we need to go to super chats so we did a little bit of longer <laughs> longer show this day, uh, today because you know typically what we do with um the members only segment is we'll save like a spicier story for uh, a timcast.com uh, segment but I figured because we're going to be having kind of an amorphous conversation about civil war and politics, it wouldn't really work out to do that. So I just, we extended the normal show. Now we'll go to Super Chats. And uh, the hate mail's already started. I was going to say, just for a warning, <laughs> there's a lot of Canadians and they're like, truckers, no. And, well, I mean, you know. But let's, uh, let, let's read it. It's actually a good question. Yeah. Wrestler Town says If Mr. Marsh started writing his book five years ago, I'd like to know which right wing activists he had to compare to the left at the conception of his book. His go-to January 6th example happened one year ago. Well, um, it was cert- like the, what inspired it was the Trump inauguration and the general atmosphere of violence. I mean, I wouldn't say at the beginning of it, I was like, 
Um, I mean, I went and talked to various prepper groups. I went to talk to various far right groups. Um, I, t- I talked to Richard Spencer. I talked to uh, like various members of the far right and going and meeting them in Ohio and like, you know, in the field research. So that's different than I would say I can icons or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I got along very well with them and uh, they and also like, you know, Sons of Confederate Veterans and things like this, like, uh, you know, um, and and sovereign citizens and constitutional sheriffs and uh, sagebrush rebels. And so, yeah, I would talk to all these different groups uh, now. You know, like the, the specific violence that they're involved in is sometimes purely in their own minds. Right. And sometimes the, the right wing groups. I mean, you go and meet these guys, and sometimes it's like, this is a hobby. This is like thinking well, about the Civil when, War. It's like it's like, am I am I with a far right group who's plotting the overthrow of the U.S. government, or are these basically like bird watchers? Then how do you compare them to the two billion dollars? And that's the that's the insurance maximum. We think the damage from the George Floyd riots was actually higher than that. Well, we there's lot there's lots of violence on all sides here. I mean, surely there's not. Sure, well, I mean, all I can. say... Like you can read the book and, and check my sources, but th- those are the sources that I have. They come from foreign. They come from foreign sources. They come. They're not Democratic or Republican. They're, there's there's no lack of right wing violence in this country. But there's certainly substantially more coming from the left. I would not say that. that my evidence would say the opposite. So there was there was a. Uh, uh, my, $2 my billion would say, dollars in damage across Well, the that's property States. damage. I mean, it depends. I guess I, I don't Which I don't think like I destroyed. I don't pe- think I 30, ever, 30 people dead. Well, I was dealing with murders. Right. Yeah, like, I, I don't think I don't think I, was, I think 26 of those were murders. And well, like I don't 32 I, were I don't I, did, I never did a compar- comparative analysis of property value damage. Um, I guess I probably should have done that. Well, this, but this, uh, but I like I, um, I I just went with the murder rates. But this is my that point seems about because the murder rates are where you get closer to. That's where you get closer to the definition of civil war. I, I disagree. I, I I, I guess technically, but I disagree. I mean, if you've got uh, a mass movement funded by corporations that advocates and, and the vice president herself is, is, is providing bail for people who are burning down buildings and smashing windows and killing people, like, we're there, man. Like, look, look, Kamala Harris Well, Donald money. Trump saying, what, you know, how about the Republican Party saying January 6th is legitimate political discourse? What, what was the specific context around that? Well, I don't know. But uh, like, I, well, I mean, then, I, then I don't think you have a point. Well, I would just say that there's certainly been legitimization of violence on the right. Like, th- th- I, I don't really think that's debatable. Uh, you got to give me a specific example because I can name January 6th. January 6th is one thing that happened one time. And I can give you over the past several years. <laughs> I mean, the French Revolution is one thing that happened one time. It feels sure, like but, but hold on, we're talking about 800 people of which several hundred uh, uh, fought their way to the front tunnel entrance. And the other several hundred walked through the back door that was opened by police. But I can also go back to like, well, Everett, there's, I, I can Oregon, talk about the Ferguson. Oregon State, the Oregon, the Oregon uh, Mike Nearman, when he, when he let in the, the rioters who, I mean, that, that, the other well, thing, the, the, the the other nothing thing happened have, there. They opened the door and the guy got in trouble. I can talk about well, the, 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 the guy went to the ice, of, a, of the legislature. The, the, the guy went we, to the ice facility with, with, uh, with an AR and firebombed it. We had uh, the guy, Aaron Danielson, get shot and killed. We had, new, we had over 800 instances of low tier, what I call blunt force really, violence. I mean, you've, like, this is something that has been repeated in this conversation. You say, show me an example. Then I do. And then you say. You keep saying January 6th. Well, that's a pretty big one, man. But that's the only one? I mean, the, like it happened well, one year plenty, ago. Well, after, after a decade of political violence from the left. Well, would you, you get, consider sovereign citizenship to be right wing violence? Because certainly the, the the groups that I do do. On what scale are these guys? About fifty murders a year. And the, and the, and those are murders based on, on people killing cops at tra- at traffic stops. So, as I said, there are there are definitional questions here. Like there, I'm not I'm not trying to hide anything. But certainly that would like you would probably not consider that a far right group. You probably you might just consider those criminals. What 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 makes them right wing? Uh, they believe in no taxes. They believe in a, they come from small government ideology. Uh, they be, they believe in the rejection of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, they well, that's they, fair, they, they like, come from they they come from a so Q, they're they're the roots of QAnon mentality. Ben, ben Stewart did so a documentary called di- so far separated if you want from, to hear about those from people. like. How does that relate to a Trump supporter? Well, we're not in the realm. Well, they're roughly on the same spec. I mean, when you're dealing with the far right in the United States, you're dealing with a, a, a huge collection of ideas that are not coherently connected. But Black Lives Matter is. 
And they march together well, by thousands. Well, and it also st- strips itself apart very quickly and, and is also filled with a lot of segmentation. So, like... Like, I mean, there, there's no... Like, I, I would say... All I'm saying here is, you know, you would you you would you would say that your right wing does not commit any violence. I don't say that. But there, well, there's some violence. But if you're looking at like mass terms of violence, like you have to look at things like sovereign citizens or QAnon or you know, et, et cetera. Like the, the, it, it would just not be reasonable to say that those are not but this, right-wing this, political this, violence. This is why I explained in the beginning that the right engages what I define as sharp, acute instances, and the left is well. Let's go, let's stay blunt. with that. Because like that seems to me quite correct, but one substantially worse, right? I so, don't believe that. I believe that. I believe that. Well, it depends what you let, mean let by me, worse. Let me, let me explain. So the sovereign citizens in the United States are not a destabilizing factor. They absolutely are. They're, I mean, the FBI declared them the number one threat to, poli- to police. But yeah, but but because they're honest. But something. the FBI, the FBI goes and sends twelve agents to a, a garage pull rope. Well, you know, this is the thing where I'm a Canadian and I'm an outsider. So to me, when you when you're against the FBI, like that's where we've the Americans oh have not had a good relationship with the FBI. Well, no one has a good relationship with the p- police forces of their country. Well, no, All but police I mean, forces like, need reform. It, but, the but, FBI's but, but, got is called what's the administrative state or deep state. J. Edgar Hoover was like the head yeah, of the see, FBI for I'm 48 a years. So, you know, the motto of Canada, like the motto of America is life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The motto of Canada is peace, order, and good government. The motto of America is in God we trust. What I find with peace, peace and order, is you can have a slave state that's suppressed its population into peace and order, and they're they're still slaves and unhappy, but there's peace. So I I think uh, a good good, good example of the breakdown, um, and there's no middle ground, right? Well, that's it. The middle ground is gone. Everybody in the chat perceives you as far left. Right. I mean, in in my own country, that would just be so ludicrous. Well, no, but far left doesn't mean like you you refer to certain people as far right, far left. It's meaningless. Well, yeah, because they're they're, they're, they're worldview signifiers. So, uh, yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, I would say I'm talking about a specific category of ideologies. So I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, like I'm doing research and uh, I come across a story about a guy. No one says his name, seriously. And uh, because if you do, YouTube will shut the show down instantly. Yeah, that is there's nothing. on the left, so I, I sit down with Jack Dorsey, and we pull up a tweet of an Antifa account overtly calling for, organizing, and inciting violence and giving instructions on what to do, and they went, meh. But Look, a right-wing dude, person- there's lots of evidence of right-wing radicalization through social media networks. Like, lots of it. Sure, sure, sure. My point is- I mean, the algorithms the algorithms you, point to extremism let, 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 of but, both but, kinds. My, so- uh, the data actually shows, because I've covered this for years, uh, a flow towards the left. This is, it's, 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 but we, we've actually had, a, there's a researcher who mapped out all of political YouTube and found it flows two to one to the left. And, and this, is, this is easily exemplified by the fact that right-wing channels get banned all the time and left-wing channels don't. They get propped up and they get mainstream media coverage. I, I, but it's, I, like, it's, I have it's, no evidence of that. So like Steven Crowder, for instance, is a, he's, a, he's a mainstream conservative. He gets strike, 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 strike. And then he has to go on hiatus to let the strikes roll off his channel. He gets forced onto Rumble. Meanwhile, you have Antifa channels. They, they don't, left-wing political channels. They don't experience the same thing. Uh, on, on Twitter, But you, the top 10 people on Facebook are all right-wing groups. Right-wing guys. And the Facebook, Ben Shapiro's of this world. And Facebook is predominantly older, you know, and boomer and stuff like that. Well, so, so what? I mean, people, eyeballs are eyeballs. I mean, but I, those are, those my are very, point very is different. That, like that, you, you have to understand, I've gone across this country. I've talked to people from both sides. You all say they're both very different. But that means you haven't they're done. They're not That means you haven't done the, the fact check. Because shows. I haven't come to your side? No. I'm not no, 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 30,000 no, 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 no. feet in no, the see, air. No, see, I don't think you understand, right? The, the right calls us liberals. Trump supporters call us liberals. Ian is a weird hippie communist something or other going. authoritarian <laughs> and we had Luke I'm a who magician. was libertarian and I'm in no, favor I'm, really I'm in user. favor of universal basic health care right I support progressive taxes yeah but in this country the left will call me right wing and the right will call me left wing well I'm, I'm you know honestly I'm kind of in the same position right like your your group is calling me far left but like when I was an Esquire columnist for years, I was considered like Norman Mailer and, and like constantly called out for all these kind of questions. But, but and like, 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 here's my point though. Sorry. Cause I, no, I, go I, ahead. Finish. And, Cause I also, we got to do super chats. <laughs> the, 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 the main issue was when you cite the FBI, it's a signal to these people. You haven't done any research into the FBI. 
And so you I, have, I've interviewed a lot of FBI agents, but you haven't done the fact checking. So like when the New York Times lies and makes up fake crap and then we have to fact check it and prove it wrong with evidence. This book is deeply fact checked. This this is why I used the deeply. Joke, the I mean, I'm I, I don't I have a lot of failings. I have a lot of a lot of stuff to be humble for. But this book is correct. So th this but this is why I use the Joe Biden Ukraine gate as a really good example. Because if you go to the New York Times and ask them, did Joe Biden quid pro quo? They'll say no. And that's factually incorrect. The, the, okay. All evidence points to the fact that Joe Biden did this. He's even on video saying he did it. And for some reason, so when the FBI doesn't prosecute Hillary Clinton, doesn't prosecute uh, Joe Biden or even investigate these things, when you have the collusion between Twitter and Facebook shutting down the story about Hunter Biden's laptop, when Hunter Biden is, is publicly known to have illegally acquired a handgun or disposed of one, nothing happens. Oh, no, they reported on all that. No, no, no. I'm saying the FBI hasn't done anything. Oh, well, when, when I mean, then, you know, the number like everyone always says that about crime and the thing about the DHS, crime is like tiny, only tiny little amounts of crime. But the, are ever the DHS specifically comes out and says it's effectively the right that is the problem without talking about BLM and the billions of dam and dollars in damage. People say they have no credibility. If you cite them, they'll say, well, one side says that they have no credibility. I mean, the problem we're in is the one we keep going back to, which is like. The sides are so divided now that like literally there is no common ground. In fact, there is no common ground in narrative. Agreed. There is no common ground like in language, in institutions. There is no common ground in language. Exactly. Right. And like when you're in that condition, you either have to find a way back to that common ground or split up. You're not far left. Like, you're right. I mean, like yeah, th this up. is it. Like you either have to work towards let's find a way to talk together or you have to say it's done you're not far left and it's unfair to say you are far left far be, left be, i mean no no for anyone to say you suit. are because the reason why you're not far left is because you're here because the real far yes. left in america and people may say the real far well, right you may underestimate would, my would desire not, to sell books would, <laughs> <laughs> they, they would not sit together and have this conversation and that is one of the biggest problems i mean i do political yeah. debate for a living even though i've been very taciturn this evening yeah um but it is hard to find an open-minded and I'm sure they would say the same about us, but we don't sit together. Crossfire is gone, right? Yes, and We don't uh, exactly. sit together and have these no. intellectual conversations. No. We have four panelists who think the way we do on our program, and they and have four. And who can screen the loudest. Exactly, and, yeah. and, that's, and that's political discourse. So I, yeah. I, I do think, you know, some of these super chats are making points that we've probably already made, and it's probably not relevant to make, yeah. but I, I do want to read them anyway. Um, Madison says, easy experiment. Wear a MAGA hat at a leftist event. Wear a BLM hat at a right event. You'll see who talks and who uses violence very clearly, the left. Uh, Blair White, for example, wore a MAGA hat around Hollywood and got physically assaulted. I mean, you, you, I, I've been to, I went to, uh, in, in the, one example I use is Boston. I don't, I mean, those, those kind of experiments to me have so little value. Like they, 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 don't, they, don't mean, they don't mean anything. I went to a rally in Boston. The right came with shields. The left came with clubs and bats. And there's lots of clubs and bats on the other. Everyone has clubs and bats. These yeah, days, I think it's the but, uh, thirty thousand feet perspective is super important if we're going to survive. The the you're familiar? yes, exactly. I want you to survive. Please survive. Like that. That's my as your neighbor, as your friend and neighbor. Please survive. And the the only way you're going to survive is by either finding some way to get into common language, or to or to break up. I think science. Let is me part let me. Of it. We just got to read yeah. more of these. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mike says a major pipeline project in Canada was attacked by 20 masked individuals with axes and flare guns deep in the woods this morning. Millions in property damage destroyed heavy equipment and work camp media silent. Well, the left would take that because like all of the indigenous protests about pipelines got broken up very quickly and, and quite aggressively. And like for, you know, like the Ottawa police were sued for 60 million dollars successfully for their um for their brutality over the G7, the leftist protests. So actually, I think, I mean, this is, that's a Canadian example, so it's actually not very relevant. But, you know, one of the things is, like, there are many people on the left asking, like, well, if these were left-wing protesters in Ottawa, would they be treated anywhere near as decently as they have been so far? Like, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, I, I, and, I, and I, I, frankly, I sympathize with that. We have the super chat from... Uh... Legama Thegayan, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong all the time. He says, right wing esoteric knowledge like QAnon is crazy, but is less insane and far less dangerous. Mainstream and institutionally entrenched compared to standard progressive dogma. It's ridiculous to make an equation between the two. 
It, I mean, I do find that interesting. That's not in my book, and I find it one of the more fascinating things that I didn't answer. Like, there are a few, like, mysteries that were kind of around the edges of the book that I... Because I tried to be really specific and, like, really only say what I know. But, like, the, the, the fascination with esoteric knowledge on the right, I, I just find it fascinating. There was a... Uh, are you familiar with the... Uh, you're probably not. You're Canadian. The indefinite detention provision of the National Defense Authorization Act. No, I don't know that. Although I should. What is that? So in... I think it was 2012, Barack Obama signed into law in... Our, our Nath National Defense Authorization Act reauthorizes, you know, spending on national defense and stuff. Yeah. And Obama uh, signed into it. He was like, oh, no, I can't believe they're doing this. But it was everybody, you know, the Uniparty puts it in. It right. allows the U.S. to detain anyone anywhere in the world for any reason at any time and hold them wherever they want. Right. And so Dave Smith was uh, uh, telling a story uh, on Joe Rogan's podcast where he said Brian Stelter was complaining that conspiracy theory videos about how, you know, certain tragic events didn't really happen were dangerous. And, you know, Dave's point was like, if some weirdo guy makes a YouTube video, it's like, sure, it's annoying. And Brian Seltzer's like, no, it's dangerous. And he goes, you know, it's dangerous that Barack Obama signed into law the indefinite detention provision of the National Defense Authorization Act and the media didn't cover it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so much that's dangerous right now. Like, you know, when I called it a complex cascading system, yeah, these things all feed into each other. You know, like one of the one of the things that I think is happening that's, you know, probably I shouldn't have brought up right at the end of this conversation is like people's sense of what is real is fraying. Right. Like they don't know what is real. Like that's part of the esoteric information. They don't they lose faith in institutions, but they're also like what is actually happening is very hard to tell. And I think that's and, and I think that's part of the contribution to this chaos is I, that they're like what was it, the use term you used semantic what was it you had a really good way of phrasing it i thought i'll look at the tape later semantic, semantic ar argument or? no a semantic carnage or something i forget what it was i don't think that was me i think you said that or something. no 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 it was you i said I, it oh yeah. you did what was it <laughs> no i'm just taking credit oh. for someone made a good point i was gonna take credit right. Right. say it in the chat you guys yeah. you know semantic I think, corruption or what, i forget what no. it was when but it was that good. love of esoteric and knowledge that's kind of what god is and it seems like that resonates with people on the right i don't think of people on the right or left much like that I, but ian seems like religion was one always of, one part of the of that. core components of religion is to proselytize and spread your religion not to hold it within and keep like it from the a decline of religion, part of the, the decline of religion movement. in american life is actually a huge part and if people this, are like reaching for some sort of knowledge that they can latch well, on to and that's q or whatever it is i i think exactly and i think you get the sense of meaning that you got from church you get in politics now mm -hmm. And it's wow, that's super. I want to. I want to. Yeah, and that's wanna, very dangerous. I want to address a lot of these super chats. Yeah, because I think you know one of the things I was making early, the point I made early on is that we agree on a lot of the core issues that's happening. Yeah, but we probably we disagree on like the. the well, I think the, you have a perspective, and my perspective is thirty thousand feet in the air. That's well, what so I would like to say. A lot of people are commenting like, "Oh, he's wrong about this. He's wrong about that." Yeah, you know, and he's wrong about civil. No, no, I think I think Stephen is very much correct about civil war. Yeah, I think there's probably core political issues that we have different views on, but like that. That's why I thought it. Would but be I don't know. I mean, I think when you actually like, you're in favor of universal health care. You're in favor of progressive taxation. I mean, the problem that we're dealing with here is that when you talk about politics, we, we've had this pol this whole this. We talked for like two and a half hours now about politics. Policy has been. Five minutes, well, ten minutes, so, like actual policies. But let me, let me let me explain. I can back up everything I claim with a source that is like a, effectively academic and mainstream certified, and uh, and my and I'm a civil libertarian. My views right. are, are are on you know uh, freedom of the individual. The uh, decentralization is is typically how I put it. I don't like the idea that you get one despot who thinks he knows everything. We've seen how that goes. But the problem is. I've been on the ground at all of these protests. I spent a, my, my start of my career going to different protests and talking to people. And what did I find? When I would go to like a right wing event, they would be very specific to the to the point of like, this is my thing. This is my thing. And right. so like a Trump rally, they'd say, my factory closed down. Trump wants to bring factories back and end free trade. Right. I'd go to left wing rallies and they'd say, I don't know. See, I had this experience when I was in 2015 where I covered the Canadian election and then I went down and covered a Trump rally and a Sanders rally, like right, right after each other. They were both in Iowa within three days of each other. And so the, this is what a Canadian debate is like. Sir, we need to spend $428 million on education. You're completely wrong. We need to spend $485 million on education. It's all numbers and it's all 
boring technical policy things. I mean, it's unwatchably boring. Then you go to America and it's God and socialism. These grand ideas that have no practical applications, that are incredibly vague and have and, and have like and just simply are essentially aesthetic categories. Here, here, and like here. When, it, when we talk, like what we're talking about here is language. It's, but if you were to actually say, like, I, I think the abortion question comes up here again, where it's like the, like, if you were to actually sit down, like what, what are our policy objectives? We want women to be in control of their bodies and we want abortion rates to decline. Guess what? Guess what? There's a really good way to do that. But you're wrong. That's right. I'm wrong because that's not what they want. No, they, they want, want no abortion at all. Right. Well, if you want to get, well, that's not ever going to happen. Right? It will by force or by decree. The United States cannot control the flow of heroin onto its streets. The idea that's going to control a major surgical procedure that you can get chemically. You don't got to look at it so absolutely. The idea among the pro-life well, right Well, that's is, my point. You shut, don't have to look at absolutely. Shut down the abortion clinics and end the government sanction of murder. Right. That's and their view. That's their view. And that is a essentially a religious view. Whereas if, they're, if, they're, if their views were policy-based, if they were like, what, what? How, how is that not policy based? Because if you, the policy is asks, what is the end we're looking for collectively? Ending what, the government support of murder. But see, that's, that's not a policy. That's a vision. No, what do you mean? Like a put, policy is like, we want a result. The result we want is fewer abortions. And if you want, if you want, the result we want is the government to stop supporting abortions. That's that's a, again, you're an aesthetic, you're in, you're in a, an aesthetic political category. You're like you're you're asking large questions about what your government is, who you are, what you are as a people. Put aside those questions. Ask what do you want? They want the government to stop actively supporting. Well, I see that's right, that's and, that, what, that's, and see, I would never like I would say that you know in sensible countries, what you ask is what do you want to do here. Like, what, what do you actually want to achieve? If you want to achieve lower abortion rates, there are many, many ways to do that. Criminalization would not be among them. But I, I think this is your bias, right? Well, I think my bias is pro-policy. Like, what I believe is that government is an agent there, of policy. There certainly is, a, 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 like, hey, we, we, we live in a country and the country takes X position. We would like the government to stop taking that position. It's that simple. Yeah. And see, that's to me is the least interesting question in politics. If the question but of like what is the government ex what, like the, what, the, what the, the pro-life crowd understands the abortion government? will still exist. They just say like here's the line we want to set. That's right. It's we'll a, it's a that. it's a moral question of their own identity of who they are as a, and who their government is. And that's you know that that is the thing about America. It's like you have this idea of yourselves as a shining city on a hill, as a as a beacon for the world. Whereas I think in other countries that are perhaps more stable, it's like well what are we doing here? Like, I, how can we make life a little bit better? How not, can we make it? How can we make it? How can we make things? The, we, we're in these systems. How can we make these systems better? And like it, it, when you get to the systems questions, when you get to those policy questions, there's actually a lot of common ground. There's actually a, it, it's easy. It's it's actually quite possible to build things together. I agree. We, we have another super chat. Yeah, here. sorry. I'm going no, no, on no, too I, long about this. No, stuff. but I, but I, I agree on that. We, we probably agree on a lot of things. And yeah, you know, but we have a good. Uh, this is a good super chat. Seth Hauser says. There are no two versions of America. It has always been a constitutional republic formed by the founding fathers. It's actually a really good point. When you said that there's a multicultural democracy in a constitutional yeah. republic, what you're, this country has always been a constitutional republic, albeit with politicians ma making improper statements about being a democracy or whatever. <laughs> or Like for 240 years. Uh, sure. I mean, <laughs> okay. the fa but, but the founding fathers had arguments about over federalism and what the republic was. Ulysses yes. S. Grant in the, in the first civil war wrote about what the republic was. They didn't call it democracy. Benjamin Franklin has comments about democracy, about how we're not a democracy and why we're not a democracy. But the point is, but that's not what Madison said, but anyway, for sure. But, yeah. but the point is, if this country was formed as a constitutional republic and we now have an emergent multicultural democracy. No, no, no I, I don't think that would be accurate to say that it's emergent. I mean, it is in place. But the, it the, has been the, in place for at least since 1860. I'll tell and you what the real the government is right ended. now is Google. Well, that's the other question. Yeah. I mean, that, and that is, an, that is another aspect of the book. Did, they, I, did I, the I, first I, Civil War properly end? And I, I mean, agree. when you go back to the original Founding Father documents, there is immense contradiction built into them, right? I, I, I think you know, the Civil like, War never ended. Well, also, you could say it began at the beginning of the country. It began with the three-fifths compromise. It began with the it began with all the compromises that were embedded in the Constitution that ultimately were between slave and free states that were not 
subject to compromise. Did you did you read about the? I think it was the 1872 uh, election in the United States. 1876, you mean? 76. The, yeah. Yeah, I always mix it up. Yeah. But where they basically were like, we'll just rubber stamp, you know, and negotiate who's the well, president. Well, I mean, you know, one of the subjects of this book is what an American occupation would look like. And of course, 1876 was the end of yeah. the first American occupation, which was the North's occupation of the South, which yep. was a low level civil conflict, right? With lots of terrorist groups and lots of, and lots of conflict. And basically 1876 was, you know, the thing is occupation doesn't never works, right? Like it, it simply never you can't you can't really occupy people against their will. It just is not feasible. Well, you oh, I don't know. Twenty years in Afghanistan, I think, proves you that wrong. <laughs> the settlers, I mean, <laughs> the North well, American settlers. I mean, when you read like the, one of the guys I interview for the book is a guy named Daniel Bolger, who's a real expert in counterinsurgency and no, and, and you know saw it in Iraq and saw it everywhere. And um, he's like, you know, there there are basically no examples of this working. But when you read his book, mm. you keep waiting for the. It's, this book is called Why We Lost. You keep waiting for the losses. Yeah. Like they never, they, they never, they don't lose at all. They win everything. Doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it makes no difference. I think like, if we were doing war gaming of your book, which we're not going to do because we'll go back to super chats, I think that the, the most important variable is who is, what party, what faction uh, is the president at yes. the time. Yes. Because and, who and controls that would be, the military. And that would be fast. I, I think the Civil War, the American Civil War, I think would have been very differently. It would have been very different if, if there was a different president of a different party. And so who controls D.C.? Who controls the military? Who controls the powers yes, of the federal although, government? I think will we'll determine an awful lot. Again, if we were playing war gaming. Yeah. I mean, I worked on the assumption in the book that the military oath would hold. Because it, yes. it, it does, it does seem to me like it would. I, I believe I've, so. I, I've not like it, it was taken extremely, extremely seriously. The, the military. I mean, one of the problems here is that the military is the last institution with widespread respect. Hmm. Wide, sorry, widespread respect in the United States, which is not healthy, hmm. right? Like that's not it, when that's the, when that's the back the backdrop. Like that's not good. But. Um, you know, the, the generals in the Washington Post a few months ago openly discussed, like, would the military fragment uh, in, in the case of a contested electoral college vote? That's a that's a whole level of terror mm. that I didn't put in the book. But it, it seems to me entirely plausible. Mm. So uh, we have this one from Babek. He says, hi, I am 20. And throughout high school, my teachers told me the parties switched and that Dems are not trying to take your guns. The left lies to children when I was a child. I will not compromise. <laughs> I think I thought this was a, was, was a, 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 a good comment. One one thing that I think is apparent to a lot of people, if you pay attention, is that the Democratic establishment makes demands. The Republican establishment says, "No, wait, don't." And so, gun control is a really good example. Uh, the second, well, yeah, one's progressive and one's reactionary. I mean, that seems that seems exactly the pattern. Yeah. So there's no one actually fighting for the. This is where, why Trump comes around. Yeah. Even though he was in favor of gun control and banned bump stocks, which was an insane and absurd policy that ruled by decree. But uh, when people on the right say the Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the Democrats ban guns, seize guns, arrest people for guns, and the Republicans say, slow down there, Democrats. This results in the Trump phenomenon, people finally, phenomenon, people finally being like, I can't take it. I don't care. Give me the human Molotov cocktail. I'm done with this. Well, that I mean, and there's going to be that on the left, too. Right. Like that, that like well, the left that's what, what, what we were saying. Well, that's what we were saying before. Like the best way to think of Trump is as a symptom. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I think that's the, 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 the when I go and talk to like NPR people and so on. I wonder if I'm the only person this year to talk to you and NPR at the same time. But uh, possible. But like the, the part they find controversial is um, that I say if Hillary Clinton had been elected, all of this would be exactly the same. Right. Like that, the, 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 the Trump, like what we're dealing with here are deep seated structural oh, yeah. problems this, this that, is why that, that are built into the they, they are they transcend completely the outcomes of elections. This, this is why I, I can't stand the Trump fraud narrative that here, I'll, I'll give you a funny example. I have never once stated that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. Right. Nor that there was widespread fraud that would have changed. In fact, quite the opposite. My first reaction when I started hearing this was I was like, dude, I'm not I'm not playing the same game, the same game where Hillary Clinton came out and claimed Russia and all this other garbage time to be yeah. fake. Then they said, we're going to do audits. They did audits. They didn't come out with anything substantive. And the company shuts down. People are like, Tim, look at all the data. I looked at all the data. There's some interesting stuff there. But ultimately, here we are. It's 2022. And, you know, the issue for me is, are we just going to keep playing this back and forth? You game? are. I mean, I, I think absolutely. I think and, you and are. It just it just. It just 
country just rips apart. Yes. If that's what we keep doing, we have to change course. But I'll tell you the funny thing. There are organizations right now that uh, there's an organization that has uh, raised tens of thousands of dollars off of the lie that I am a proponent of Trump's fraud. Narrative, right. Even though it's 100 percent fake, you'll get news outlets lying about my views. Oh, man, I'll give you a great example. They take clips uh, of me. They take clips of Joe Rogan. There's a really great post. I can't remember who put it up. I think it was uh, Zed Jelani. We've had him on as a guest several times. He said, in all those instances of Joe Rogan saying the N-word, he was actually arguing against racism. Right. And they were taken out of context to make him seem racist because sure. it's, it, you can, so here's why I think, you know, you mentioned we're in civil strife. I think it's civil war. Because well, you, you, I, that, 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 that's a technical threshold. Like, I, I, like it, it, it's, still, it's strictly terminology. But right. we're, we're definitely seeing the normalization of political violence. I think we can but, agree on that. But uh, I'm talking about fourth and fifth generational war. Have you researched any of those things? Well, not really. But. So this is, this is when, uh, think, think about what the purpose of war is, right? To gain control of an asset resource land or a people. When you look at what started the first civil war, it was this, mm-hmm. these military bases. And then eventually, like preserving the Union, gaining control and, and holding one government over the South because they were trying to secede and form their own country or whatever. Mm-hmm. What if you never had to fire a shot to accomplish that? Well, so yeah. Fourth and fifth generational warfare is when you get into insurgency with fourth generational and fifth generational is manipulation and propaganda. You mean mimetic warfare? I mean, the thing I find pretty, I'm, I actually wrote about that for foreign policy. I, I think it's a really, you know, I actually think what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine, not to go off on a completely different thing, but I think it's one of the earliest instances of truly mimetic warfare. You know, Marshall McLuhan said the Third World War will be an information war fought with no distinction between civilians and military. Yep. And we're in it. And we're in it. Right. Like, and I think, and I think in that sense, if you were to think of the, of the Civil War as a mimetic war, or as an informational war, as a diathetical war, which is what Lawrence of Arabia called it, then you are absolutely in it. That's why I think when we, if we talk in terms of left and right, we've already lost the war because our mind has been changed by the meme to think in that way. Well, I think, you know, there's like, I think it's natural to have a left and a right. And I think it's natural to have disagreement. Like, I don't, I don't think you need to be in a unified country to, that, that, that's, that that's somehow better. You have to feel you're on the same team, though. It's true that like, it's, yeah, it's you natural to, to have a left and a right, but not to have two political parties in control of a government. That's not natural. That's I got been a, formed on purpose. I, w- I want to read this one super chat and then make a point about many of the other ones. Uh, Gold Mecro says, thanks for coming, Stephen. You've been an interesting voice on these matters. But understand, for many, you're asking them to sacrifice all they feel is right and honorable for the sake of peace with those who hate them. Well, would you rather be married or right? It's like what I said right, right. at the beginning. Mm. It was, that's why I asked you about the, the health care mm. thing. And, you know, I take that point. Yeah, 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 like I genuinely do. When, like when, if someone were to ask me that, if, if there were like, if that were the choices, I don't know what I would do. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, comments where they're like, you know, this guy is wrong, and you know, yeah, yeah, obviously. Sure. But to, to the people who I'm are not everyone's cup of tea. No, I'm for a, sure. I'm okay and, with that. and and I knew uh, uh, having seen your Twitter. Yeah, we had these disagreements, but I thought, you know, if we, like we we try inviting many other people of opposing views. They don't come on the show. You can have me anytime. Oh, I, I thought it was a fantastic conversation. Yeah. And for the people, the people who are saying they don't want to buy your book, I think that is, that is very, uh, uh, that is wrong. I don't think the, I think book, they should is, buy your the book. book has stuff in it that is not me. Well, no, like, no, I no, think look, it should be, I think you should, I think I genuinely think it's worth reading. Look, the, the, for, as an, so I, I understand if people are like, I don't want to buy his book because he doesn't deserve my money or it'll make right. him rich or whatever. whatever. No, no, I think they should read it because... As I often say, if you think he's wrong, wouldn't it be valuable if they knew all of your thoughts and ideas and research and where it came from? And then, by all means, you can take the book. We've actually had a couple of people comment saying they did read your book and felt you were wrong or whatever. Right. And that's the right answer. You if know, someone, at least if, almost 40 percent of the sources are Republican. Like I would just add. Like, I don't it, think like, these people like Republicans. Right. Either, though. Yeah, <laughs> probably, I probably didn't help myself. There. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, um, I read CNN all the time. And then I'm like, that one's wrong. That was wrong. And then right. I read Breitbart too. And I'm like, that one's framed poorly. And that one's wrong. <laughs> but like, because you have to read everything yes. and then try and figure out on a lot of articles, it's tough. So like, yes, because when the New York Times says X is true, I'm like, you just said something like, how am I supposed to know it's true just because you said it? I, I, well, as someone who's worked for a bunch of publications, I would say if something is in the New York Times, that is the that's the most reliable news source of anything uh, I've worked for, with the possible exception of the Atlantic. When when you go to the, the Atlantic, New York Times, when the Atlantic written, is fact, when something's fact checked by the Atlantic, it is 
fact checked to within an inch of its life. The and, the the New York Times, I caught in a, a, what I view as a major scandal of publishing a news piece, getting boosted in the algorithm, and altering it to an op-ed for sustained growth. And oh, yeah. they do it all the time. Right. It's well, called stealth editing. But not, other than that, I mean, you look at what they did with Project Veritas, where they just lied about them and then basically never fact-checked it, got sued. Even it was so egregious that they've actually, surprisingly, Veritas has gotten past a motion to dismiss, which is crazy in public definition. I thought the New York oh. Times lost a lot of its credibility when they published Anonymous and they said this was a high-level Trump staffer with intimate details of the Trump administration. And then it turned out it had like the same position I had in the Bush administration where, you know, you, what did you, you have a job. Of, uh, but but like their editorial board, their their senior leadership allowed that to go forward saying this is, they made it look like it was a cabinet position and they did it for political expediency. What did you guys think of the Palin trial? Oh, the dismissal? Yeah. You know... Lib we, uh, we talked about that last time, and libel is, is very hard. Well, I think Times v. Sullivan, Sullivan needs to be <laughs> removed. Are you familiar with what that is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, get rid of it. You really or, think or, so, eh? I mean, it would make you... Hey, oh, there you go. I, I, thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was fascinating that... that um, Someone took was the fall guy, right? That that one editor said, "Yeah, this is on James me. Bennett, the you ultimate." The, um, I mean, it's, you, you James can, Bennett is a uh, he's a fascinating man because he's been in the middle of these struggles and and and, and, and attacked by both sides. I just don't for think being, in New York for can, being like absolutely superb at his but job. You can, I mean, the I, best op-ed editor un, un, I've ever worked. I just for, don't think sure. the New York Times would ever allow such a piece about about Kamala Harris. Oh, I don't know about that. You could. I, I, let, I, I would not. Let, I would not let, agree with that. Let, there's let, Brett Stevens. There's a lot of people. Let's time, wait time, and see. Yeah. For those that are familiar, Times v. Sullivan is the standard that basically you have to prove uh, if defamation is of, of a public public figure, you have to prove that either knew it was false or were acting recklessly. Mo and malice. Well, actual malice. Actual is, malice means that they uh, uh, that they knew. That they knew and that they wanted to hurt this person. No, no, no. Hurting is is, a, is in, in Canada. It's completely different, and it, so it's a it's the, so much easier to sue somebody for, for yep. libel. In the yep. U.S., actual Love malice Canada. doesn't refer to um, yeah. intention to cause harm necessarily. Right. It's like you. It's knew that it. you knew it was wrong and you didn't care. Yeah, that's right. Recklessness very is that, hard to prove and imp impossible yeah. unless you get pat in, into discovery. Recklessness is that for the New York Times, for instance, if they publish something, you'd have to prove that they didn't follow their standard procedure for verification. Right. And if you can't get past a motion to dismiss, and you can't because of its own, sta it's, it's, it's insane. You, you, someone, uh, they, they, they outright make up stories about me. I can't, I can't get into them because of litigation and stuff like that. But they'll outright lie and make everything up. And then they're just like, we assume it to be true. Like, we, 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 we had a source who said it, therefore it's fact. That you should not be able to get away with that. And the anonymous sources stuff has gotten out of control. It's insane. And then not, not on top of that, you have to prove damages. So what they did... That's it, easier to do. No, 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 no. Well, you could have... Palin could have done that. So with Project Veritas, the New York Times argued they're, uh, they're so... They, they, they're, they're, their reputation is so tarnished you can't possibly cause them damage or yeah. something. Like. That's what happened with Benedict Arnold. Do you remember that? That's, he was sued for libel. He won. And he said, "Your but your reputation is worth six six cents." And they, and <laughs> That's he, what they gave him. And they gave him. And they gave him. Wow. Uh, yeah, that was like in whatever. You know, he the traitor Benedict Arnold, right? Yes. Like in the in, in the Revolutionary War, he was like they were like, "Yeah, you were slandered. Your reputation is worth six pence." Before he left America. No, All right. No, after. Oh. So I'll I'll read. Uh, we'll just read two more because uh, we, we've gone a bit long tonight, and I think it was worth it. Papa Romano says, "I disagree with him a lot, but a great guest." Right, Yo, thank you. Uh, people need like need to understand. We would we would have a lot more guests that are more like mainstream journalists and leftists if they were willing to come on. Am I going to become your pocket leftist? No. Definitely. No, no. You and no, Vosh. No, Vosh. Vosh. Maybe Vosh the pocket Canadian. Times. For yeah. sure. Hey, yeah. no. We sure. need more Canadian leftists. <laughs> yeah. Dude, no, Crossfire but, but was one I of the best not... shows of all time, news-wise, <laughs> and we need, that's kind of what I want. I will know? say, yeah. we have made a lot of money off people not liking you. <laughs> They're, they're sending in super chats like he's wrong. I don't yeah, like it. It's so good right. to have someone from Canada because like, your perspective is invaluable for uh, as for me as an American. I was grown in this system, so I need. Well, I do think we like, you know, we're as I say in the book, we're like Horatio to your Hamlet, right? Like we're the small, irrelevant country right on the edge. We've like I've all we've lived in. I've lived in America. I have American friends. I love America, but I'm not American. Right. Like, so I'm not part of this. You know, America is not my mother. Right? Like, like it's like when you say like with he like healthcare like that my blood goes up, 
With your right. stuff, my blood does not go up. You see? Right. So there's different things that are important. Uh, absolutely. Gun control, Let stuff me, like that. Oh, well, yeah. Gun control is different. Canada's, like, again, it's really odd because, like, nearly half of Canadian homes have a gun in it, but it's not the same gun culture at all, right? So there's, like, and it's certainly much, much more regulated. And in right? Canada, cops kick in people's doors and go into their houses and arrest them, and it's harder to do in the United States. Though they do it, for sure. Well, I mean, I don't think we have, like, quite... Canadian cops are incredibly nonviolent. I mean, that's part of the problem with, uh, with Ottawa. Like, you know, when, when the truckers came for Paris, they just sent in the tear gas, and it was all over in half an hour. Like, that happens every day in France. Is, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, and, like, that's what would happen here, incidentally. Like, if a trucker mm-hmm. convoy started and they went into Chicago, it would not, it would be over in a day. Yeah. Like, it would not, it would not be, like, Canadian police well, being like, let's try and not hurt anybody. But, I mean, Occupy I think we Wall might Street, get to the end of this thing down. without... Well, Occupy Wall Street is actually an interesting yeah. counterexample. Um, but, like, I, I think if, you know, if this thing ends without any violence, God willing, um, it will be oddly a kind of national achievement. Was there, was there violence from BLM in Canada? There or? was a small... Well, it wasn't... Um, there, were, there were BLM marches. They were much smaller yeah. uh, than, than here. Um, there, was a, there were a series of um, indigenous... Uh, movements oh, that I were ab- that. About, about the about, about about pipelines, but also about you know uh, historical genocide, cultural genocide. Uh, they they were burning down churches because of wow. um, because of they were essentially right wing indigenous groups. Um, well, nas- I would say not national clear. groups. Like they, well, I wouldn't. They would not fall into either right. category. They're they they're themselves right, and so they 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 would. I would not put them. They got I would, support from the left though. Um, I actually think they have a lot of broad support, like Stephen Harper, who was the first, um, who was the con- last conservative prime minister. He was the first person to acknowledge um, crimes against uh, in the uh, in the educational system, and he actually made a big, he made a very powerful statement about it. I want, I want to, I just read one more because we've gone long, and we'll wrap it up. But um, Cowboy Ish says, Tim, the guy has demonstrated that he has bias. Why is it wrong to give him our money to check for ourselves? So I, I think, I wonder if this question is... Shouldn't it be wrong, right? Is, it, is, that, is that what they mean, or are they agreeing with me? I wanted to read that because my point is, if you only get news from one source, you'll have no idea what you're arguing against. Mm. And then I, I remember I was working for Greenpeace, and I was outside of a bookstore, and I saw Glenn Beck's book, Arguing Against Climate Change. And I was like, I should read that. And I, went, I, was, I think I was like 21. I went to the bookstore and I started skimming through it to see like some of it, read, read a couple of chapters and I didn't buy the book. I put it back. But I was like, <laughs> if, if buy I, my book. Don't read some, it in the store. If someone's going to make an argument and you're like, I completely disagree with this person. Wouldn't you want to arm yourself with the facts and data to properly be able to argue your points? Yes. And not only that, yeah. I don't think people should take everything you've said here as everything that's in the book and they might. Oh, no, it. no, no. We barely touched on. We only touched on two chapters. Right, right. I think people might read through that and be like, oh, okay, this one has less to do with some of the stuff they talked yeah. about because we have our bias on this show. But long story short, may, may, I, I understand them saying they don't want to give you money. That I get. But reading it's not as much that as much can. money. <laughs> like it's, not, it's like it's just a man's got to you know? eat. Also, yeah. send his get, kids to I school. Only get and... I only get a royalty. Like Come it's not on. like it's not like you're giving me the money. I just I just think uh, I'm a proponent of learning and reading as much as you can, and that's why like I'll watch CNN read some what, what they're writing and, and be like. When I come out and say, hey, this story was wrong, it's because I read the story, read about the author, looked at what they were researching, and said, here's what they missed. Hmm. Not because I I. I saw the headline and went, that's not true, bye, and then to close out the article. No, I got to read that stuff. Otherwise, I'm like... I think reading in itself is an act of depolarization. Yes. You know, like, I think actually trying to understand people and trying to be in their language for a bit yeah. is, really, is really helpful. You it know, I, I wrote this book explicitly trying not to judge. Like, you know, you can say I'm part... But, like, I went and talked to all sorts of people. I wanted to get their... Like, I really would feel like I'd failed if I didn't feel like the Oath Keepers that I interviewed felt that they were represented fairly. Hmm. Like, I, 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 I am not trying to skew anything. I, right. I, like, I, I am trying to, even, even people who I consider outright criminals, right? Like, I'm trying to get their point of view and put it on the page. And I think that's, that's key. Like, if you want to understand people, you have, that's what you have to work towards. Yeah. You know? All right. 
I think we should uh, we should we should wind it down here. So uh, go to timcast.com, become a member. We're not going to do the member segment because we de- we decided just to do this segment extra long to have this deeper conversation. And uh, but but becoming a member does help support all of our work. And there is a massive library, so there's tons of other segments you can watch, and it is greatly appreciated when you sign up because your membership sustains us. You can follow the show at timcast IRL on Instagram. You can follow me at TimCast as well. Don't forget to like this video, smash uh, that, smash the like button, subscribe to this channel, share uh, share the show with your friends. Do you want to shout out anything else? No. You, your book, your social media? Just the book. Well, I'm at Stephen Marsh on Twitter if you want to follow me. But, you know, you They'll probably, probably disagree don't. with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, the they bo- should. They the should book, tweet at you. The, the books that... Uh, oh, please don't tell them to tweet at me. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, nice things. Not. Don't do that to me. Like, uh, 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 six months from now, you come back and you're wearing a MAGA hat. And you're like... I, I learned, I, they, I believe everything they've said. I was depolarized. Yeah. <laughs> I was depolarized, or I was repolarized. Yeah. Or I was just uh, turned into an American, oh, really. Yeah, like, you're wearing an American flag. Yeah, right. Yeah, right on. Uh, Daniel. You want to yes, Daniel else? Turner, Power of the Future. It's great to be here. And I want to give a shout out to our farm Instagram page. Oh, cool. So love your local gay uh, sheep farmers here in yes. Virginia. <laughs> Bristol Farm, Virginia. And it's called Bristol Farm because that was the first hotel we ever stayed at in Vienna, the Bristol Hotel. Oh. So we named our farm after that hotel. And it's so Bristol Farm, Virginia on Instagram. It's new. We're trying to get people because we love small farms and we're trying to connect with other small farmers. Now, so, everyone like can agree with that. Yes. Yeah. That's Chickens. like who can if you can't agree with that. Thank you. Yeah, Local exactly. farming. Like yes. these these leftists, they hate farm animals. I swear. <laughs> they just don't want to yeah. eat. They the hate the way to depolarize is to get the hell out of cities yes. and get away from uh, people. No, you're not that wrong. And breathe. Make people and raise, a, raise a couple chickens together. Yes. And have them focus on the yeah. chicken's, chicken's eyes. Success. And yeah. people won't be so angry to to tweet and hate and things like that if they have to muck out stalls and clean Plus and, fresh eggs. And, and get fresh yeah, eggs. Exactly. So, I mean, you know. Yes. Thanks for coming in and doing the top down view. That's really, really. Pleasure. Yeah, man. Pleasure. And maybe next time you're here, we can go a little higher and look from like 100,000 feet. <laughs> from Well, to Cosmic next time. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Cosmic orders. Beautiful. Yeah. Follow me, iancrossland.net. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you guys all very much for tuning in. I always love to have conversations where we don't fully agree on everything. To me, that's very much the spice of life. So I appreciate you guys for bearing with us and for sending us all your crazy super chats. You guys can follow me on Twitter and minds.com at Sarah Patch Lids. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Become a member at TimCast.com, and we will see you all tomorrow night.